Thursday show, we are gathered here again to listen to another dispensation of the Lord Buddha's teaching, the most profound teaching that the world has ever seen, the most magnanimous gift that all of humanity, all beings, divine, celestial, have received, and that is the Buddha's gift of Dhamma. So before we commence, let us all take a moment to observe the five precepts. And in order to do so, I ask you all to invite you all to recite the Namaskara Pater three times and all together. Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhamman Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Sangham Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Sangham Saranam Gachami Sarana gamanam sampunnam Panati pata vera mani Sikha padam samadhyami Adinna dana vera mani Sikha padam samadhyami Kame su micha chara vera mani Sikha padam samadhyami Musabada vera mani Sikha padam samadhyami Sura meraya majhapamada thana vera mani Sikha padam samadhyami Tisarane na sadding pancha silang dhammang sadhukang surakitang katwa apamade na sampade te. Okay, we now please be seated. And again, as usual, before we commence, let us take a moment to reflect on the fact and acknowledge the reality that it is because of the supremely enlightened one the perfect one, the blessed one the unparalleled one, the unvanquished one the supreme Buddha that we have this Dhamma today for our liberation, our emancipation our freedom from samsara it is because of him, it is because of his heartless it is because of his dedication selfless effort throughout many Yawns in samsara, 
to discover this Dhamma himself and then to teach us. Because he made that effort, we have the gift of Dhamma today. So let us all take a moment to pay homage to the Lord Buddha in recognition of this fact. Namo Thasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Thasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Thasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa And also as you should before we commence let us take a moment to invite all the devas, brahmas, spirits, demons and the dead. Those beings who we may have come across in our previous births. But in such births we do not have the gift of Dhamma to donate to them as a gift. As well as that they may have helped us, supported us, assisted us in many ways in shapes and forms. They may have been our mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, nephews, grandparents and so on and so forth. Or perhaps our teachers, who may have shown us the way, guided us, helped us to be where we are today, not just in this birth, but in previous births. Today that we have the gift of this Dhamma, let us all invite them to join us. Let us open up these places so they may join us, rejoice in this meritorious deed, listen to this Dhamma, and find the liberation and emancipation that they seek in samsara. So now, as I make this invitation, I request you all to extend this invitation in your hearts and in your minds to invite them all here to join us and to listen to this sermon. Samanta chakka vale su Atantra gachantu devata Sadhamam Rajasamsa Sunantu Sagha Mukadam Dhamma Savana Kalo Ayam Badhanta Dhamma Savana Kalo Ayam Badhanta Dhamma Savan Kalo Ayang Badhanta Also, let us take a moment to once again acknowledge the fact that not having received the gift of Dhamma our lives were very different to the lives we live and conduct today. Not just in this birth, prior to us receiving this Dhamma, but also in previous births. Where our associations were with immoral people, ignoble people, and where they defiled our minds with Raga, Dvesha, Moha, desire, aversion and delusion, and blinded us with avidya and Tanha, ignorance and attachment. We may have offended, insulted, abused and desecrated the Aryas, the noble ones who are the Samma Sambuddhas, the Pacheka Buddhas, the Arahatta Buddhas, Anagamis, Sakurdagamis, Sotapannas, be they on the path or having attained the fruits, as well as the Buddha's ministry, the Sambuddha Shasana. For any words or deeds of offense, desecration, abuse with, we may have directed towards the Aryas as well as the Sambuddha Shasana, either knowingly or unknowingly, such deeds, such harsh words, may today block, hinder our progress in the Dhamma. So, prior to us commencing this sermon, let us all take a moment to seek refuge, or rather, seek forgiveness from all the members of the Mahasangha, the Aryas, as well as the Buddha Shasana, for any words of desecration and abuse and slander that we might direct it towards them. And also, finally, let us all make a firm resolve that through the course of this sermon, if there are any gaps in my knowledge, in my understanding, in my comprehension that keep me from attaining the noble attainments of Sotapan, Sakurdagami, Anagami and Araha, may, through the course of this sermon, I be able to fulfill such gaps, fulfill my knowledge, fulfill my understanding, fulfill my comprehension and be able to attain those achievements or rather achieve those attainments 
and understand the supreme bliss of Nibbana. So with that firm resolve in mind, I ask you all to prepare yourselves to listen to this sermon. Okay. It's not easy getting getting here, is it? It's not easy. It's quite difficult. I know that. I know that because for a very long time I made the reverse journey of what you're making now. And actually to be fair, the journey you're making now is a little bit more difficult because now you have to gather everyone, round everyone up, load everyone onto a bus and then come all this way. Whereas I just it was just one person, one passenger that had to be commuted. Oh and thus Alhamdulillah as well. Who do you think has made this difficult on us? Who's to blame? Come on, let's find someone to blame. It's always nice to find someone to blame, is it not? Someone we can point our fingers at, have a rant at. That's what this index finger is for, right? You know, in Sinhala it's called the Dabarangi. Why is it called the Dabarangi in Sinhala? In English it's called the index finger because you go through the index using that finger. You go through your telephone directory looking for names. But in Sinhala, this is called the Dabar Angila. What is the Dabar? It's a fight. <laughs> so this is what most people use this finger for. To have a fight. To tell someone off. To show someone who's boss. To show someone why they got things wrong. And to blame others for, well, their weaknesses, their faults. I think this Dabar Angila is overrated, if you ask me. This index finger is overrated. We use it far too often, only because we point it in the wrong direction. Turn it 180 degrees around and you can use it as often as you like. But when it's pointed outwards, there's a problem with that. Because we like to shoot the messenger. There's a saying, right? Don't shoot the messenger. We like to shoot the messenger. In other words, we like to find fault with people that bring us the results of the deeds that we've done. We talked about this in the previous sermon as well, to some extent. So the reason that, you see, the reason that I'm sat on this seat today, the reason that I'm delivering this sermon to you, the reason that you're sat on this seat, having to listen to this sermon, these are all things that we are having to do. We are having to do them, not we get a chance to do them. Not, hey, hurrah, we got to do them. No, we are having to do them. If I weren't here today, if I hadn't been born today, I wouldn't have had to sit on this seat and preach to you. If you weren't born today, you wouldn't have to be on that chair today, listening to me speak. You wouldn't have had to make that journey. A tough, long journey. What time did you have to leave? Early in the afternoon? Right after lunch? So you wouldn't have had to make all that, all that effort. This is why we are having to make this effort. We are having to make these efforts because we are still here. We are still here. What if you like being here? If you like being here, then you are going to keep coming back. This is why I wish that you never would come back. Before I, preach, before I begin every sermon, I make a firm resolve that, you know, while I ask you to make a firm resolve that may, through the course of this sermon, I be able to fulfill my gaps and any, any gaps that I might have to to my understanding, I make a firm resolve, may I never get to see your face again. How harsh I am. No, I make this wish because I hope that this is the last sermon that you will have to hear. I hope and I pray and I wish that this, may this be the last sermon that you will have to hear. Because after that, once you've gotten on the track, once you have become your own teacher, once the Dhamma, the gift of Dhamma is with you, you don't have to be here. You can be here if you like, but then you don't have to be here. That is what I hope, that is what I wish, and that is what I pray for. Now that we've been born, we are now recipients of the results of all the deeds that we've done in the past. They keep coming to us. And in a world where Mara is king, and we are his loyal subjects, then we have to play by the rules of the book which Mara has written down. So when he calls the shots, we've got to dance. When he plays the beat, we've got to dance accordingly. Just think for a moment about how many 
shops he had called he is called just through the course of this today today this week this day let alone this week the things that you had to do not you did, not you like to do but you had to do you had no choice but do no one liked cooking anyone like cooking because if you really enjoy cooking then i'm going to ask you to cook every single day of the year until you die and guess what we're going to take you to a dhan teller what's a dhan teller in english is there a word for that too an arms house oh that's the first i've heard of that thank you very much an arms house where you can it's kind of like i eat as much as you like but usually doesn't turn up that way because once you're in the queue you get served and the next time you come back it's a very long queue so but it's an arms house okay so it's where people and this is a custom in sri lanka a lot of buddhists and also people of other religions do this and i think in uh, other people of other religions do this a lot actually in mosques and temples and churches and so on and so forth where they feed people that need food but in the arms house the objective is not necessarily to feed people that need to be fed but it's more of now a, it's like a party where everyone's invited and it's a street party i think that's how the this is in the modern version of the arms house it's a street party there's food people come stand up in a queue and then they get served so we're going to send you to one of those places where so you can cook all day every day if you really 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 like cooking but i don't think that is the case if you didn't have to eat would you cook no if you didn't have to would you like to shave one of the things i like i like least to do in the day shave but it's something i have to do got no choice I think I had to do it since the I was the age of 14. I was really looking forward to the day. At one point in my life, I was looking at that and I was I wanted to imitate him. So one day I thought I'd pick up pick up his shave and start to shave him. And then he came and saw me and he said, "Oops. <laughs> you opened Pandora's box, son." So these are things we are having to do. Building houses are things we are having to do. going and working doing jobs or things that we are having to do i know this is a lot of this is new you know it's, it's old stuff you have heard me say this plenty of times before but from from time to time i think it's important that we remember this we remind ourselves why it is that we are here today why is it that we are having to be here today don't think of this visit here don't think of having to be here as a luxury in one sense it is a luxury in one sense that a lot of people don't get this chance but think of it as a it's not a right but a privilege this is not a right but a privilege because if it's a right then you just enjoy doing doing it it's my right i get to do it but when it's a privilege you understand that there's something that i'm needing this is why i call it a privilege so this is a privilege the reason that all of us are having to be here is because we are still on this journey the day you become an arahant i will not see you here again well leave that to aside the day you become a sotap and you will not have to be here again then you can do your own thing the dhamma will be your guide the dhamma will show you the path so we are having to be here and always remind that ladies and gentlemen let's not make this a time to rejoice i hope i'm getting the message across this is not a fun party let's all go on a sunday afternoon to a sermon let's all get on a bus tickety do let's go get something to eat let's stop on the way sing a song right you know how we used to go on trips school trips those days that's not what this is by the way i'm not saying that's how you do this but it's just a reminder that we are having to be here we are having to be here we are having to be here because every moment that we are awake every moment that we are living we just keep inviting the results of the karmas that we've done both good and bad and the results of the karmas that we've done just keep us going in samsara for every moment that we are awake we don't know which hornet's nest we might provoke you don't know whether it's right to step forward or step back or even just stay where you are how do you know how do you know which causes you might line up to bring the results of which deed that you've done in the past if you step forward there's a snake if you step back there's a gaping hole if you right, stay right where you are 
there's a snake on the branch of the tree that you're standing next to. Now where do you go? That's just a metaphor. But you get the idea. So don't ask me if it's right to lift my arm up or put it down or keep it where it is right now. Who knows? I can't tell you that. So really it's a risk just being alive. It's a risk doing anything. Because you don't know what kind of hornet's nest you're poking your fingers at. How it might turn out to be. This is because all things are conditioned. This is what we spoke of last week. And I think last week I was quite thankful towards the end. There was one of you in the audience who gave me something really profound to think about. I don't know if you remember that. Remember last week we spoke of how I had instructed one of our young novice monks to give an indication to someone else when they, when they were feeling the fire of Raga, Dvesha and Moha. And then I suggested, perhaps uh, not very practical, I suggested that as a couple, a man and a woman in a married loving relationship, in a trusting relationship, that, you know, if you go walk into a mall and the, the, this husband, he sees a girl and despite the fact that he's married, he senses this unusual feeling. Well, it's a feeling that he's sensed many times ago, but it's now not right to feel that way now that you're married. But that tinge of a sense of desire arises in your heart. And I said, well, why don't you let your wife know that, hey, I'm looking at that girl and I'm feeling this tinge in my heart. She's pulling at my heartstrings. And I said, if you're Kalyana Mitras, if you're there to provide noble friendship to each other, then why don't you go ahead and do that? And of course, that was a, a point to laugh. <laughs> because you reminded me that, well, Swami Nuhansa, you say that, but how can you do that in a relationship? That's just practically impossible. What would a woman think? It wouldn't be right to do that. It wouldn't be right to feel that way. But how can you stop what you feel? You can stop doing things with your arms and with your legs, with your face, with your eyes. You know, you can, you can, you can shut your eyes, yes. But how can you stop the feelings that arise in your heart? If not for the Dhamma. Without the Dhamma, how can you stop desire arising in your heart? In your mind, of course. How can you stop anger arising in your mind without the gift of Dhamma? How can you stop these feelings of vexation arising in your mind if not for the gift of Dhamma? So you can't put brakes on your mind, can you? Even in the Shasana, in which I am ordained, as a novice monk, there were ten precepts that we had to observe. Now as a high ordained monk, there are, there are lots more, some 270 odd precepts that we have to observe. And depending on how you break it down, how you categorize it, you can bring it up to many millions if not billions. I think one, at one count, I remember reading a book, I think there was about 91 billion, 863 million precepts or something like that. It's, you know, how, when, when, you, when you combine each of the precepts with the fact that you can do it with your, uh, with your, with your body and through, through speech and with, you know, through, through action, bodily action and so on, then you, the combinations are, are so many. But there is nothing in the code of conduct, in the vinaya, the discipline, which speaks of how is it that I should think. There is nothing that prevents me from thinking having desirous feelings, having feelings of aversion or delusion or, or desire, not in the Vinaya. Because you can't stop that. What's the point of trying to stop something that cannot be stopped? Because the only way that it can be stopped is through the Dhamma, not through discipline. Yes, there is Raga Vinaya, Dvesha Vinaya, Moha Vinaya, but that is the gift of Dhamma. That is through the Dhamma that you can do that, not by establishing a code of conduct. I mean, look at the, the, the five precepts that you have observed today. Pānātipāta, Adinnādāna, Kāmesu Michachara, Musāvāda, Surāmere Majjapamādattāna, Veramani Sikkāpadam Samādhyāna. Are these things that you do with your mind? Yes, there are the deeper meanings for the one who wants to attain Nibbāna. But on the surface, superficially, these are all things that we, you, you do with either speech or, or action or body. So they can be stopped 
put brakes on using precepts. But the only break that you have on the mind is the understanding, the comprehension of the Dhamma. So, clearly then, as we were talking about this loving relationship, trusting relationship, where I was suggesting, why don't you go and speak to your wife and say, hey, I'm looking at a girl and I'm getting excited right now. Then, the response back was, Swami Nasa, that this cannot be done. Not in any kind of relationship that you speak of. Not in your dreams. Might have been the thought that you had. Now, that was a really good point for us to really think about. Because, what does that prove to us time and time again? When two people in a loving relationship, a loving relationship, say to each other, Hey, I love you. Do they really mean that? Do they really mean that? When one guy says to a girl, Hey, I love you. Isn't what they really mean, I love the things that I get to see because of you. I love the kind of things I get to hear because of you. I love the smells that I get because of you. I love the taste that I get because of you. And I like the touch that I get because of you. When the sights, the smells, the taste, the sound and the touch changes beyond what it is that I like, no longer will I be in love with you. So who do we love after all? Ourselves. I love you because I love me. That's what really we should be saying. Next time you give a Valentine's card, you know, because this is a good point. You know, if you're, again, a, a, a couple who are trying both to, to practice this path to Dhamma, of Dhamma and attain Nibbana, here's something that you can write on a Valentine's card. You know where it says, I love you when you bring it from the shop. Believe that, use another pen and write, because I love myself. And then give it to them. So when they open that envelope and take the card out, now there's a point to talk about. I love you because I love myself. But when someone just says, I love you, all you've got to say is, as if. Oh, yeah, right. Because who we really love is ourselves. Who we really love is ourselves. Because it's the self that we always want to, to preserve, to protect, and to conduct throughout samsara. The self that passes away and therefore we have to give rise to. This mama. The self that we, that we have to keep giving birth to every, every moment that passes by. And that is Rupa Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vinyana as we have talked several times in the past. And this Rupa comes in Rupa, Rupa, Shabda, Rupa, Gandha, Rupa, Rasa, Rupa, Sparsha, Rupa. Sight, sounds, smells, taste and touch. And Dhamma, Rupa. Which are the thoughts that come into the mind. So there are six types of Rupa. And these Rupas we receive from the outside world. So when the outside, we are dependent on the outside world to receive these rupas, these forms. I don't like to use the word forms because I don't think that it really conveys the meaning. But the word rupa really, I mean, that is something that makes, that is closer to me and I, I, I get the, the feeling behind it. I hope you're okay with that as well. Beg your pardon, sir? Sense impressions. Sense? Impression. Sense impressions. Sense impressions, that's a good one. So, these sense impressions that we get through sights and sounds and smells and tastes and the objects that come into our mind, the mental objects. These are sense impressions because yet it leaves an impression on the mind. So we receive them from the outside world. Did we speak last week about the man who, had, who broke a leg and went to the doctor? Okay, let me tell you about him. So once upon a time there was this man who broke a leg and then he went to the doctor. So he got carried to the doctor because obviously he can't go to the doctor now that he's broken his leg. He got taken to the doctor and then when he was at the hospital he's now waiting for the doctor to arrive. The doctor is due to turn up at 7 p.m. It's quarter to 7 so he's waiting for the doctor to arrive. He's in great pain. The pain is, is excruciatingly painful and so he's waiting for the doctor's arrival. So he sat on a chair the nurses have attended to him at, to whatever extent that they can. They've offered him a, a bottle of water, a glass of water, whatever, to ease the comfort maybe a little bit, perhaps a, a, a painkiller of some sort. But said, you know, you have to wait for the doctor because otherwise we can't really do, do much help to you. So he waits. And slowly but 
gradually and eventually seven o'clock arrives but not the doctor so he speaks to the nurse nurse where's the doctor I thought you said he was going to be here by seven yes sir uh, please bear with us a moment let me ring the let me ring the doctor so the nurse quickly rings the doctor and finds out that he's stuck in traffic so he's going to be a little bit late now once this information is passed down to this patient he's not happy about this because he's got a a broken leg which is extremely painful so now he waits not happily he waits so it's half past seven and there's still no doctor agitatingly he asks the nurse where is the doctor and they ring again and again find out that the doctor's got a flat tire so the nurse is very hesitatingly now comes again and informs the patient well sir we've just found out that the doctor's got a flat tire so he's going to be just a little bit more longer you're going to have to wait and then now he's furious is there another doctor that can see me no sir he's the only doctor that we've got on call so he's just on his way please be patient so he waits because he has no other option so he waits now it's eight o'clock no doctor it's half past eight no doctor and this man is now furious he goes mad he starts shouting yelling screaming and swearing at the nurses and all the staff in the hospital he starts swearing at the chairs these uncomfortable chairs you've asked me to sit here and wait for two three hours he starts shouting at the nurses you said he was going to be here by seven o'clock how do we, is this the kind of service that you provide I mean, remind, ask yourself have you never been in this situation where you've gone into some kind of business some kind of establishment and asked the members of staff is this the kind of service you provide what kind of service do you call this who do you think I am I am a paying customer ask yourselves have you not been in such situations you know when you didn't have an understanding of the dumb when you thought the world revolved around who <laughs> yes so mad and, in, uh, and furious this patient starts shouting and screaming and yelling at, this, at the staff at other patients at the cleaners at everybody even those who are not at fault you see this man is in a great deal of pain because he's in a great deal of pain he's in a great deal of discomfort and he wants to relieve himself from this pain relieve himself from this discomfort but is he able to do this right now without the help of the doctor because there's no doctor right now no he's not able to do this he's in a lot of pain a lot of discomfort a lot of distress and he's unable to relieve himself from the pain if you ask him what is the cause of your suffering sir what is he going to say the doctor the nurses the traffic the flat tire other patients these chairs the blooming hospital why because he's in a lot of pain and he can't relieve himself from the pain that he's in now ask yourselves have you not been in such situations have you not done the same this man does not for a moment think about why it is that he has to be in the hospital in the first place he does not for a moment reflect on the fact that it's because he's broken a leg that he's now in the patient's ro waiting room had he not broken a leg would he have had to turn up at the hospital had he not had to turn up at the hospital does it matter what time the doctor comes does it matter if the doctor comes at all no hasn't he forgotten the true cause of the problem which is he's broken his leg let's rewind a couple of hours from the point he broke his leg and see what had happened well not a couple of hours say 20 minutes he was on the roof he climbed the roof to fix his antenna so he could watch TV while he was on the roof his wife called from the kitchen honey we've got this nice jackfruit that you love to eat this sweet jackfruit that you, I know you so love to eat why don't you come and take a bite why don't you come and eat some and jackfruit apparently is his favorite food so the moment he hears the word jackfruit he now forgets that he's on the roof <laughs> he says oh just a moment I'll be there 
right away. And boy, wasn't he there right away. Two steps forward and he's there right away. He forgets he was on the roof. He's broken, he's fallen and he's broken his leg. Now no more jackfruit. Now it's time to go to the hospital. Now, think about this for a moment. Why was he on the roof again? To fix the antenna. Why is he fixing the antenna? To be able to receive the television channels. Why does he want to receive these television channels in a, on, a clear, on a clear signal? So he can watch TV. Why does he want to watch TV? Because he loves what? Rupa. Why, what was the appealing invitation that he received when he was on the roof? Jackfruit. If the wife had said, we've got some uh, malum that I've just cooked, why don't you come and try some? Yeah, yeah, later, later, later. Give it to me with lunch. But not the jackfruit. For the jackfruit, it was a straight away. So, what was the appeal there with the jackfruit? Is it the thorny skin of the jackfruit that he was so attracted to? No. Then what was it? The taste. So, is it not the attachment that he has to the rupa rupa, the rasa rupa, the gandha rupa, the sparsha rupa, Right? The smells, the, the tastes and the, the, the sensations, all these sense impressions that he is now attached to. Isn't that really the true cause behind this suffering after all? If he, didn't, if he wasn't attra- attached to the Rupa Rupa, would he have to have climbed the roof to fix the antenna? No, there wouldn't have been a need for that. Even if he had climbed there on the roof, if it wasn't for the attachment to the Rasa Rupa, these tastes, the jackfruit, would he have had to come running? No. So really, if he's an intelligent one, while he's waiting for the doctor, what should really he be contemplating on? Where is the cause for suffering? Is it not attachment? Every single time. Now think, ladies and gentlemen, every time you've suffered in your life, if ever you've thought that what makes me suffer is the world outside, then on that occasion you have failed. You see, once you're in pain, to relieve you from pain, yes, you need sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. No question. To relieve you from, you from pain. Now this man's leg is broken. Now you need the doctor to come and fix you. The doctor lives in the outside world. The doctor does not live in me. This isn't, we're not something, the doctor doesn't live in my mind. The doctor lives in the outside world, right? So you now need the doctor to relieve you from pain. But that pain you got yourself into. That is where the problem is. You got yourself into the pain. Now to relieve you from pain, we are seeking help from the outside world. The doctor has to now come and relieve you from this pain. But the problem with this method is that this is relief from pain. Today it's his left leg. Six months later it's going to be what? His right leg. For as long as he has to go back up onto that roof to turn the antenna, to adjust the antenna, and for as long as he has this attachment to jackfruit or chocolate or whatever the case might be, he's going to come running. Think for a moment, isn't this what we've done in our lives? So, you see, whenever you feel suffering, even if it's physical, because I know, we, you know a lot of the time we talk about the mental suffering, right? Because we say, let's forget the physical part, it's the mental suffering that we have a problem with. But you can go a step beyond that. Even when you experience physical suffering, I think it's worth taking a moment to look at the story. Where has this come from? Where's the origin? Nidana Katha, as we say in Singh. Where's the origin? Even the physical suffering that we experience today, if you look at the origin, it was always because of what? Attachment. Then, is it not right for the Buddha to say, to proclaim that all suffering is because of attachment? Today you might say, hey, mosquito bit me. Whose fault is that? It's easy, easy to say it's the mosquito. So what do you do when the mosquito bites? Squash. Done with the mosquito. That's just one mosquito gone. There's a whole swarm of mosquitoes coming. 
Remember then, when you are experiencing even physical pain, that the reason that you are having to experience this is because you have a body that can experience pain. When you are feeling hungry, even while you are cooking, ladies and gentlemen, when you are cooking at home, think for a moment, why is it that I am having to cook today? I don't enjoy doing this, but why is it I am having to do this? When you go to work, I mean I remember the days when I used to love going to work. I really enjoyed that. Because I lived in a world of delusion. I loved getting out of the tube. And then as we got out at Leicester Square, I looked outside and saw all those tall buildings, glass clad buildings, and I thought, wow, I'm in the heart of the world. And I could see my office building from afar. And everyone in the polished shoes and coats and ties, Ladies and gentlemen walking up and down the streets and I thought, wow, I'm so such an important person, look at me. And I had my coat on and I, as I strolled down the, the road walking to my office, so my office was the, was the largest building in, in, in the area. And then it was, it, was glass, it was a glass clad building so you could see the lift from the outside and after you got into the lift and the lift was escalating, you could see the outside world and you thought, mm, look at me. I'm rising above the world. I lived in so much delusion. Because for a moment I forgot to think that why is it that I'm having to be here right now? Why is it that I'm having to do a job right now? Why is it that I'm having to make a living? Why is it that, I have, that I'm having to be the breadwinner of the family? It's because I still experience hunger. It's, still because, I, I, it's because I still experience the pain that my body experiences when it's too cold, when it's too warm, when it's too hot. So what was the cause for that? Being born. And what was the cause for that? Attachment. To what? Rupa, Shabda, Ganda, Rasa, Sparsha, No matter where you look, once you've turned all the stones up, ultimately it's going to be where? Attachment. There is no suffering in this world where attachment is not the root cause statement. That's the fact. There is no suffering in this world where attachment is not the root cause. Yes, an Arahat and Mohanse experiences, experiences pain as well. They experience hunger. When the Buddha's leg got cut, when Devadatta rolled the stone, that hurt him. Did he have attachment, Did he have attachment then? No. But what was the cause of that? A deed that he'd done at a time when he had attachment, when there was delusion in his mind. Again, we Vipaka. These are the results of the deeds that we've done in the past based in attachment. Now, if attachment is the problem, if attachment is the root for all problems, ladies and gentlemen, show me one person in this room that you can point your finger at, out and say, he's the problem, she's the problem that I'm suffering right now. Name one person. Okay, what about your family? Mothers, is it because of your children that you are suffering today? Fathers? Husbands, is it because of your wives you are suffering today? Children, is it because of your parents you are suffering today? Well, you know the answer. It's always attachment. Always attachment. See how much attachment is done to us? Not done for us, done to us. See and look what it has done to us. If you are not clever, to see how much damage attachment can do to us. We fall for the sensual pleasure that we experience and then we open our arms and invite attachment into our lives with open arms. Rupa, come my way. There's plenty of room. <coughs> come on in. Shabda, come on in. Sights and sounds and smells, come on in. Make yourself at home. Where's this home? My mind. Come and dump yourselves here. I love you guys. Come on in. Remember last week we, I asked you the question, why do you sleep with a stranger? Why do you get to bed with a stranger? Remember? Strangers who come into your house and then do nothing but damage to you, they are okay while they are stood outside. But the moment they walk in, how can you trust them? And when you look in the other way, they run away with all your gatherings, with all your possessions. Everything that you loved, everything that you so desired, taken away in the flash of a second. This is what attachment can do to us, ladies and gentlemen. And gladly, unfortunately, 
there is only one problem that we need to fix. If your car breaks down and you take it to the mechanic, how many points might he have to inspect before he finds the cause for the trouble? He might say, hey, come back in an hour. Why? Because there's lots of places he's got to check. It might be the steering wheel, it might be the fan belt, it might be the carburetor, it might be the silencer. You don't know. I mean, you have, you've got to first check. But what if you're suffering? How many places do you need to check? How many points do you need to inspect before you say, here's where the problem is? Tell me. <laughs> How many? One. Attachment. Attachment is always the one and only problem. Luckily. Quite fortunately. Why? Because there's only one problem always and every single time that's the problem. So that's the only problem we need to fix. Once that problem is fixed, all problems have been fixed. One problem. One problem. Remember I've asked you in the past, how many problems do you have to deal with every single day? From the morning you get out of bed to the time you get back into bed, how many problems you have to deal with on a, on a regular daily basis? Going to work, bringing up your kids, finding some money, putting food on your plate, paying the bills, getting the car serviced and MOT'd. All these things you have to do, paying the insurance, claiming from insurance, getting married, getting a divorce, having kids and bringing them up and finding schools. You know this better than I do, right? Some of you have lived in lay life much longer than I have, so you will know this much better than I do. Lots of problems. But here there is just one problem we need to fix. And the assurance that the Buddha gives us is fix this problem, all other problems fixed. One problem. Now, the reason that we feel that whenever we feel this suffering, where we need to fix is the outside world, is because of ignorance. Remember when you were on a cot, going back many, many, many years for some of you, and many, many years for some of the, for others, and a few years for others. When you were baby, when you were a baby in a cot, and you couldn't tell left from right, and all you knew when you were unhappy was to do what? Cry. Yes. Do you still do that? No. When you knew nothing else but cry when you were unhappy. When you were just a little toddler and you were on that cot, and you were crying, what did most mothers and fathers do as they approached the cot? Give the, co- give the cot a bit of a swing and then they might have brought a toy and said, Ah, oh, Puta, look at this toy, see? See, ah, 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 don't cry, don't cry, take this toy, see, look at this toy, Puta, look at this toy, see, beautiful toy. And then I remember those things I used to dangle over my, over my cot. You, you wind it and then it keeps turning and then make, plays, this, plays this music. So my mother used to walk up to me and say, Puta, look at this toy, it's a beautiful toy, right? And then some of them you could squash and then it would make a noise. So, think about this for a moment and try to understand what was it that our parents tried to teach us. If you are crying and you are in pain, how did they teach us to relieve ourselves from suffering? What did they ask us to rely on? Sights and sounds and smells and tastes and touch. If you are crying, if you are unhappy, if you are in distress, here is a lovely sight. Look at it. Nowadays, you know, they don't bring toys. Now it's the TV. The TV comes on. Now the tablet is given to the child. They start playing on the phone and start playing Angry Birds. This is now how parents put their children to rest when they're crying. Right? Angry Birds. So, what are parents trying to teach the children? If you're... Because, I know, you know, in my grandparents' time... When the child was crying and the mother wanted to pacify this child, she would put the child on her legs and then as she was swinging the child, she would speak about the qualities of the Buddha, Buddha-guna, speak of the qualities of the Dhamma, Dhamma-guna, speak of the qualities of the Sangha, Sangha-guna. There were stanzas that you would recite. 
with children when they used to cry and even some other poems that behind them were very profound meanings like Ambala Me Pinapina behind them there are very profound meanings behind all of this these are gifts from our ancestors today it's just words for us today there's this old fashioned stuff but those days you see whenever the child was crying what did the parents do remind the child about the Buddha even if the child couldn't understand a word at least that's what they would start to speak of, speak of about the Dhamma, about the Sangha remind them of, about those great qualities so as the child grew up the child didn't learn that when they were sad, when they were unhappy, when they were in, in a state of distress it was sights that were going to come and relieve them they didn't, they didn't grow up thinking that they didn't grow up thinking that it was the sounds and the tastes and the smells and the touch that was going to come and relieve them from suffering because the parents only spoke of the great qualities of the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha so as the child began to grow, grow up then the child was at least knowledgeable at least they could me- they memorized these poems but they didn't know the, the meaning and then once they began to understand the world they began to go and find out about the meanings remember Buddhaṃ Sarane Sirasadara Agena Dhammaṃ Sarane Kitapahada Agena remember what about young children these days do they know no that's a real pity that's a real shame because these were practices that we received as gifts from the Aryas the Rahatan Hansis who lived in the past our forefathers who even showed us how to bring up children in the right way in the proper way in the way that a child would be molded into an Arya as they grew up but just think for a moment how do children grow up now where do they find solace on the TV on the internet and on their mobile phones in sights and sounds and smells and tastes and touch sensual pleasures, sensual indulgence because what was, the te- what was it that was taught to them? if you are in a state of suffering seek refuge in what? the Buddha? no <laughs> seek refuge in sights if you are in a state of suffering seek refuge in sounds seek refuge in smells and tastes and touch in sensual indulgence seek refuge in sensual indulgence that is what we taught our children so how do we expect our children to be happy then how do we expect our children to become great people how do we expect them to become good people if all they know is when I'm in a state of distress I just run and find myself some sights and sounds and smells and tastes and if what I want is with somebody else then by hook or by crook I shall get what it is that I want because this is what's going to relieve me from my suffering never did they learn relief from suffering is not the answer to the problem never did they learn that it's redemption from suffering that we have to do find out for the cause for suffering which is always what? attachment I think a couple of weeks ago we started speaking about the 24 qualities of the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha and I'll speak to you about perhaps one or two more today the one we spoke of I think a fortnight ago was Anuttaram Punya Ketta so I'm not going to go over that again but, and I hope you remember and if you weren't able to then you can go back and listen to those sermons then there's one called Anjali Karaniya Anjali Karaniya because you see even if we it's never too late ladies and gentlemen it's never too late Unless someone's done an anantriya papa karma, a heinous crime, a heinous sin rather, killing the mother, killing the father, killing an arahant, hurting the Buddha, and schism in the Mahasangha, which you can't do anyway, unless you are a high ordained monk, so don't have to worry about that. But the other four, unless you've committed one of those four heinous sins, it's never too late. So even if there are parents here who might think, actually, you know what? I should have spoken more about the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha to my children. Is it too late now, Swami Mohansa? No, it's never too late. It's never too late. What if you're 87 and tomorrow is your last day alive? Is it too late to speak about and reflect on the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha? What if you're going to be going at 135 and it's 133 right now? You've got two minutes left. Is it too late to reflect on the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha? 
How many times in the Tripitaka have we read stories of where the Buddha, all that he did, because that was all that this person was able to receive. Look at the sight of the Buddha. Just look at his physical body. And then that was his ticket to the heavens. The Buddha realized that if you, if you, if you, if you don't get this opportunity and you die, you're going to be straight. It's a straight ticket to the hell. Uh, but if I don't have enough time to teach you the Dhamma, or you don't have the capacity to understand the Dhamma, but just the sight of me is going to be enough to have praise in your, in your mind and in your heart. And that's going to be enough to take you to the heavens. At least so you can postpone this Papa Karma, which you've done in the past to bear fruit, go into the heavens and th- at least then you still have the chance to understand the Dhamma. So, if the Buddha did that, you know, it's not too late for us to do that today. So it's important then, parents particularly, we take some time to understand these qualities. And, la- and as I reminded you a fortnight ago, these were, not, these, were, these, these were not qualities or rather attributes that were wound up into a stanza, a gatha that the Buddha gave us to just keep reciting. These are qualities that we have to instill within ourselves. So what is Anjali Karaniya? What is Ang in Singhala? Ang. Ang at Iguna? Yes. The horns. The antlers. These are the horns of the animal. Right? So you have cows and deer that have antlers or horns rather. Ang. Do you remember when infants come into this world, when, when all of us were born, how did we have our fingers stretched out? Oh, clenched up. Yes. That's how we have been. Gulikar again. Clenched up. A clenched fist. What do you clench your fist for normally? To help someone or to punch someone? To pet someone? Or to show someone who's boss? A clenched fist? Is that a, is that a sign of peace or a sign of violence? It's a sign of violence. So we, see, from the moment we came into this world, that's how we came into this world. What is there to say about how we're going to be living the rest of our lives if we don't receive any Dhamma? Really, you should be looking at a baby and going, oh boy, (laughs) here's trouble coming to this world. Why? That's a warning. It's a threat. This is what I'm going to be doing to all of you. This is a threat. With both arms, both wrists, a clenched wrist, uh, a clenched Sorry, fist, right? Clenched fist, yeah, a clenched fist. This is a threat to the entire world. I'm going to whack you. I'm going to give you a good beating. If you don't give me what? The sights, the smells, the sounds, the taste that I like. So beware. The baby's here. <laughs> guli karagana. So guli, you've eaten guli, right? Samaposha guli. Agdala guli. So sorry for our listeners who are non-native speakers. I'm using a few singular terms here because others, there's no other way I can give you the meaning of this word, Anjali Karniya. Guli Karno is to make a ball. So, Guli. So you make a ball or you rather you clench your fist. Uh, you, you, you clench your fist. Guli Karagana. Anguli Karagana. I'll come to Anjali Karagana in a moment. This is Anguli Karagana. An is what again? The horns. That you used to what? Be kind to others? What do animals use horns for? To attack. To fight. Right? To get into battle. Again, how do you know the alpha male in a, in a pack? The animal that's got the, the biggest antlers. That's the alpha male. So to be the alpha male, you've got to have a big set of horns. Have you got a big set of horns? Let me ask you this way. Are you the alpha male? At school, are you the alpha male? In your class, are you the alpha male? At your workplace, are you the alpha male? When you go to a party, are you the alpha male? If you're saying yes, then just feel your head and you might be able to sense something. A big set of antlers. Ang. Gulikar again. So, guli is again, as I said, to clench. Now, clenching two fists with five fingers in each. How many in total? 
ten. What is the ten that we make use of to fight with, to cause harm and distress to the outside world? What ten are we speaking of? The ten unmeritorious deeds. The ten unwholesome deeds. Abhidya, Vyapada, Mityadrishti. So that's covetousness, anger, hatred, wrong view, and then Panagata, Adinadana, Kamesu Mityachar, which is killing, stealing, engaging in sensual misconduct. Then Musavada, Pisunavacha, Parushavacha, Sampapalapa, lying, uh, harsh words, frivolous speech, and backstabbing. So these are the ten. The ten unmeritorious, ten unwholesome deeds. The ten things that we use to cause harm to whom? The outside world. Others. Un Gulikar again. So this is a threat, this is a warning to the outside world. I am going to hurt you, I am going to harm you, I am going to destroy you using the ten. What ten? Again, the unmeritorious, unwholesome deeds. Now, for someone who has that state of mind, if that is their mentality, do you think they are on the path to Nibbana? No. That's not the path to Nibbana. So if what your if what your mentality is, if if your state of mind is to hurt others, to harm others, using through engaging your speech, body and mind in the ten unwholesome deeds, then you're straying away from Nibbana and it's causing harm and damage to others. So if you want to instill within yourself the qualities of the Sangha, all the way from a Sotapana, Sakurdagami, Anagami, Naraha then once you've created this punya keta, this field where it's now ready to, to be sowed, as we spoke a fortnight ago, the next step that we ought to do is to start shedding the unwholesome deeds. This is the next step. Start, stop, to stop engaging in the unmeritorious deeds through speech, body and mind. What is jali karane? What is jale? Water. Is water a hard substance? No, I'm not speaking of ice. I'm just talking of water. No. It's a very soft, soft substance. It flows freely. That's water. So what is Jali Karane? To move from a state of hardness to a state of softness. To let go. Letting go of what now? This unmeritorious deeds, the unwholesome deeds. And the state of mind, that mentality where I am going to threaten you, I am going to hit you, I am going to whack you to get what the sight, sound, smell, states that I want from the outside world. I am, I am a threat to you, I am going to attack you. If that is our state of mind, then no way is that person on the path to Nibbana. So on the path to Nibbana then, it's about time that we stop engaging in the unmeritorious deeds, in the unwholesome deeds. So this is the Anjali Karaniya Gunaya, the quality of Anjali Karaniya. Now, the conventional meaning I don't reject for any moment. The conventional meaning is, the Mahasangha is worthy of worship. Right? That is the the conventional meaning that is given. The Mahasangha is worthy of, of worship by bringing the fingers together of the two hands bringing them together in this form and then paying respect, worshipping. Now, I don't reject that for any moment. However, what I want you to think about is how do we worship today? What is the act of worshipping today? You've seen people worship each other, have you not? And when you see two people worshipping, or rather one one worshipping the other, one's the donor, the other's the recipient of this worship, What do you normally see? Do you not see that there is one who is younger, the other is older? Normally. Or one's the student, the other is the teacher. Or it could be one's the poor man, the other is the rich man. Now, tell me, does the Buddha embrace and speak highly and praise the 
the caste system or is he one who entirely rejects it? Kammana vasalo hoti, right? Kammana hoti brahmano. It's the things you do that make you a Brahmin, not where you were born, not who your parents were, that make you a Brahmin or a Vasala. So it's the things we do. However, what this worship has become today is a mark of respect from one who is inferior to the other who is superior. So all of a sudden we've introduced inferiority and superiority complexes into the Buddha Shasana. A Shasana that we have been gifted with to do away with inferiority complexes, superiority complexes, to do away with the self. I mean, think about it for a moment. If you're, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're an elderly person, in comparison to someone else who is younger to you, you know, if, if they don't come and worship you, does that not make you feel uneasy? Some occasions, maybe not today, but think about in the past. You know, you walk into a certain place. There's a, uh, there, you know, let's say it's a young couple who's just, who's just got married, and it's custom that they come and worship and so you see them going and worship another elderly person but they don't come to you though they don't come and worship you now how do you feel about that hey I'm elder to you you should be worshipping me just because I've lived longer than you have just because what I've lived longer than you have that is what we use today to that is what this worship has become a token of today one who has lived less worships one who has lived more. So what about if there is a young person who is a Arhatun Muhanse? He is only seven years of age. You and I walk in and we are what? In our twenties, thirties, forties, fifties and so on. You go in there and go, no, you are younger, I am elder to you. You worship me now. Is that appropriate? The term for worship in Sinhala is Vandana. Vandana. Let me offer you the meaning behind this word. Andabhava Vaikanda Nyaya. Vandana. And, what is Andh? Blind. Vaikarna, what is the meaning of that? To dispel. Yes, to see. Nyaya, what is that? The theory, the path, the method, right? The path, the method to dispel, to cease blindness. This is the meaning of the word, Vandana. So, when we worship somebody, what we should be worshipping really is the quality that we see in that person, not the person. This is why time, you know, time and time again I, 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 I remind you, even if after the sermons you feel that you want to worship, it's not the person inside the robe that you ought to be worshipping. It's the qualities that you should be worshipping. Qualities that you then reflect on at that point where you make that mark of respect. Who are you respecting now? The person? No. What is there to respect in this person? This is just a mind and a body. Which bit of this body do you want to respect? My left arm or my right arm? Which bit? How about my stomach? Would you like to respect my stomach? So then, what do you want to worship? What do you want to show respect to? My clothes? Would you go and worship a robe if it was, if it was on a line, cloth line? So what do you worship then? It's the quality that you should be worshipping. And again, it's a mark of respect, but it's not only a mark of respect. This is a solemn promise. This is an oath. What is this oath? I see within you certain qualities that I still do not possess. This is a solemn promise that I will henceforth make every effort to instill those qualities within myself. This is what a true worship is. Now where is the superior inferior? Now where's the self in this? Because all you see is the qualities. Good qualities. Great qualities. Now tell me, are there barriers if this is the way that we worship? Are there barriers to who can worship whom? So now can't an elderly person go and worship a younger person? 
if you see qualities within them that you still don't have because again it's not the person that is that is being worshipped do you think the Buddha would have sat at Jetavana just waiting there for people to come and worship him right next come on come on hurry up now I've got stuff to do with Anandhandru on one side right everyone from an orderly queue come on then where are your tickets let me check right off you go worship right there quickly 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 do you think the Buddha would have conducted such a procession no but yes he allowed people to come and worship but every time he worshipped what he allowed people to do was think of who the Buddha is before you worship think of what the Dhamma is before we otherwise you know when we worship the Dhamma what are we worshipping think about it there is no person so what are we worshipping then it's the qualities of the Dhamma. It's the qualities of the Sangha that we worship. Now, no matter? No. Because it's not for us to judge. Mm-hmm. Are there people in this world who have no good qualities? I understand what you're saying, madam. This is why I've reminded you again in the past when you worship a monk, don't think that it's that monk you're worshipping. In your hearts, in your minds, that should be the most venerable who? Sariputta. It should be the great elder Moggallana. It should be the great elder Mahakashapa. That's who you should be worshipping. Because you are worshipping the Maha Sangha, not the Hamadru. The Maha Sangha. And the Maha Sangha includes the Buddha. The Maha Sangha includes all the monks, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas. From time immemorial to, at, to, all, you know, to, 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 to the future. Every bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, upasaka, upasika, to ever come into this Sangha, to, to, to ever have instilled within them at least one quality that is the quality of the Sangha they all are included in this in this basket that is the Maha Sangha because the thing is this if you come across people who are like that who are shouting on, on media or you know in person or whatever right remember Nibbana is not something that fosters in a mind that does not have uh, happiness, bliss, prasade. I don't know what the term is for that. I'm going to have to find that out. Anyone want to volunteer? Prasade? No. Okay, task for me. I'll find out for next week. Nibbana does not foster in a mind that does not have that, that quality, where you're able to see the qualities, the good qualities in somebody else. Because remember, everybody has good qualities. And, I'm, and I agree that you, you, you accept that matter. Because only the Buddha can judge somebody. Because only the Buddha can see what qualities another person has. And again, the, the Buddha doesn't, doesn't judge people. The Buddha, whenever he makes a remark, remember when I spoke to you about when he, when he called Portila Tucha Portila? He wasn't actually making a, an abuse to a person. It was the quality that he was he was faulting. You know, what did, the, what did Portly try to do? He went around preaching the Dhamma, but not taking the Dhamma for himself, not understanding and making use of the Dhamma himself. And the Dhamma that he taught was for people to become Arahat and This nature which is two, right? Which is what? Defiling, bad, evil, Acha. To go beyond. Tu Acha, Tucha. Tucha Portly. So he was not a mark of disrespect to the person, but he was rather finding fault in what he was doing. So even when you, so if you come across someone like that, someone who speaks harsh words, someone who fosters evil, someone who tries to instigate anger, speaks threatening words, right? If it's someone who's donned a robe, forget all that. Because every time you see that, every time you reflect on that, 
oh they speak bad words or oh, they they don't you know they they're instigating fear they're instigating anger and hatred that's what they're doing every time you begin to see that every moment you spend seeing that then joy in your heart disappears and in its place starts taking what anger hatred disappointment frustration none of these are feelings that are going to are sentiments that are going to take you to nibbana they are all feelings that are and, and sentiments and sensations that are going to take you away from nibbana why sacrifice our nibbana because of someone else's work someone else's action possibly possibly i, I want to have to i'm going to go back and check check the books on that one so it's to, it's, to, it's to see the good in other people and sometimes it's very difficult to do that there are some people in whom good is very difficult to be seen but if that person were to be taken in front of the buddha wouldn't the buddha be able to see good in that person so is it not just the fact that we are incapable of that isn't that where the fault is isn't that where the weakness is i mean there are times when i've had that problem speak to people and you're really struggling to see the good in that person because the moment they open their mouth all they've got to say is something bad about something somebody else or something else the moment they do something it's something that's going to harm somebody else so you really struggle you're really striving to see the good in them but take that person in front of the buddha how oh, and he'll he'll start singing a, a hymn sheet here are all the good qualities which monk you were unable to see so do not judge that person how many times has that happened in the buddha's time how many times thank you once yes think about that for a moment angulimana he is a murderer now can you tell me anyone on tv who's been who's a murderer who's come on tv you know when they try to instigate fear and anger and things like that or oh, they start desecrating members of the sangha none of them are murderers to everybody else who lived in the in the country they were all looking for angli mala so that they could lock him up and punish him for all the crimes that they, that he'd done for all the people that he'd killed whereas the buddha what was he looking out for angli mala for to make an arahant out of him this is the garuguna hita again i don't know the english term for that i'm going to have to find it garuguna hita I'll, I'll explain what the garu guna hita is though guna yang dakala ekada garu karana pulwam to see the good qualities in another person and to be able to respect that to be able to acknowledge that let alone respect to be able to acknowledge that that there is there's good in other people even the worst person that you can imagine because remember one day they're going to be an arahant aren't they think about this for a moment today there are people on media who shout at us who find fault with us who try to blemish our character okay now what did we say at the start of this sermon we reap what we sow so to for me to be receiving such treatment from others what do you think i might have done to them the same right exactly the same now when i had done that let's say 500 births ago to that person if someone came up to me and said you are worthless you are useless you are never going to be uh, attaining nibbana ever you are just the the scum of the soil and to hell with you if someone had come and said that having not been able to see that in 500 births time into the future he is going to ordain again in the buddha shasana and then fulfill the path to nibbana they weren't they simply they just weren't able to see my good qualities 500 births ago but today this person whoever that person might be is now bringing to me the vipakas of the karmas that i have done in the past that very person is going to attain nibbana one day he is going to become an arahant one day so If 500 births ago someone came and pointed a finger at me someone shouted at me yelled at me 
wouldn't they be doing karma again? And wasn't that karma going to bring Vipata again? Because now they are pointing their finger, shouting at someone who is on the path to become an Arahatul Nahse, maybe in 500 words time. So today, if we, just because someone shouts at us, someone finds fault with us, someone abuses us, we start to do nothing else but find fault with them. Aren't we doing new karma again? That's why I say, don't even throw a stone at a dog. Why? Didn't the, wasn't the Bodhisattva born a dog in previous births? Wasn't that an animal who was going to become a supreme Buddha one day? So how do you know the next dog you see is not a Bodhisattva? How do you know the next monkey you see is not a Bodhisattva? How do you know? The next cow or goat or whatever animal you see is not a Bodhisattva. How do you know? So whatever, let us know. If that's what we have to say for animals, what about human beings? How do we know? So that's one point. The second point is, always remember that because we can't read someone else's mind, from their perspective, what they're doing is right. Always remember that. From their perspective, what they're doing is right. From their perspective, what I'm doing is wrong. You know, so the sermons that we do, for instance, one might think what you are trying to do is completely distort the Buddha Dhamma. From their perspective, they are doing the right thing. So if they are doing the right thing, if they are doing the best that they can, in, you know, don't we say this to people who work with us, or children who come and say, Ami, I can't do my homework. What do you say? Put up, do the best you can. Or at work, someone comes and says, Sir, I don't know how to do this, I am really struggling. Don't worry, do the best you can. So you are asking them to do the best that they can. Well, they can only do the best that they can. They can't do the best of what they can't do. So if the best that they can, according to their, from their perspective, according to what they know, what they believe, what they understand, is that I am distorting the Dhamma, then really shouldn't they be standing up to me? Think about it for a moment. From their perspective, I am doing damage to the Shasana. Then shouldn't they be standing up to me? Shouldn't they? They should. Because their belief, their point of view is, what I am doing is genuinely wrong. They are not doing it out of hate. I don't believe that for one moment. I don't believe that whoever is saying these things, whoever is doing these things are doing it out of hate. They are only doing it out of trying to do the best for all. So, shouldn't they be doing that then? To the best they can? It's for each of us to decide what's right and wrong for ourselves. Just because someone says he's right, we don't become, we, we don't go and join their camp. Or we don't go and take a seat in the other camp either. It's for each of us who are intelligent human beings to make our own choices. Do we go take sit in that camp or this camp or do we not join either camp? We all got the choice, right? Freedom of choice. So we all make a freedom of choice, but for anyone who is trying to do the best they can from their perspective, if we believe that their perspective is wrong, then we try and help them look at, it, look at the world from a different perspective. We try and help them, but again we don't do it out of spite. Because what they are doing is not out of spite. They are doing it because that's what they think they ought to do. Remember, let's say you used to take alcohol. And I'm, again, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong to take alcohol, but let's say you don't do now, but you used to take alcohol. Okay? You were in a gang of friends who used to take alcohol all the time. Now, whenever you had a problem, you used to go and see your friends, and they would say, Machan, don't worry, sit down. Take a drink, take a shot, and everything will be fine. Now, from his perspective, all he knows is, if you have a problem, what do you want to do? Take a drink. That's all he knows. Doesn't know anything else. But let's say after a while, this guy gets to listen to the Dhamma. And then he begins to understand, no, taking drinks is not the answer to the problem. That's only going to make problems worse. What you're going to have to do is find the cause of the problem and start treating the cause of the problem. And an attachment is the cause of the problem. Now what is he going to do? Oh, you know what? Don't worry about the alcohol, that's not going to help. Here's the, here's the real solution to the problem. Here's where the problem is. Let's try to fix the problem. But, before he understood this, he tried to do the best 
he could as a friend. How good of him? Now think about our parents. I often speak about my own parents, right? How my parents are still have they have wrong views about a lot of things about the world. They don't believe in Kamavi Parka. They don't believe in next birth, past birth. They don't believe in a lot of these things. So when I was suffering in my life, they showed me a way to try and be happy. But they never were able to teach me that it was attachment that causes suffering. They never were able to teach me that. But being the parents that they were, to the best that they could, they shed every drop of tear, blood and sweat to do the best that they could for me. Now for me, is it wrong to look back and then tell them, and tell them, how dare you? You should have taught me that it was attachment that caused all this suffering. Not come and, you know, shower me, me with toys and all these things. That's not what you should have done. Is it right for me to say that? No, it's wrong for me to say that. Because what they did was the best that they could. From their perspective, they were doing everything that they possibly could. Yes, today I'm able to see that what they did was not going to help me. That's why I now I'm on a different path to eradicate attachment. But just because I am now, I now have a different view, it's not right for me to turn my head back and go, how dare you? Because I was in the same boat back then. And we were all paddling together. So, you know, when we begin to understand that the results that we receive are always that of the deeds that we have done, ladies and gentlemen, you know, life becomes so easy to live. It really is. Because who do I have to fight with now? Exactly, madam. Who do I have to shout at? Who do I point my index finger at? Indeed. There's nobody else. I would even put it this way. Let's say you're walking on the road, someone comes and hits you with a stick and it hurts your head. Now you think, right, let's go to the police station. People come, flock around, and then they put you into a car. They put this man into a car, and then they start driving to the police station. Go to the police station where, it's, where you can file a complaint. Take the man with you, sit in front of the sergeant, and go, Mr. Sergeant, this man, he hit me with a stick. I have a gaping wound on my head, which, for which I'm now going to, I, I need treatment. But... Can I please ask you that you advise this man not to do that again and put me in jail? Why? Who's the wrongdoer in the first place? Hmm. These, are, these are results for deeds I've done in the past. Because when you understand this, you will not do another unwholesome deed. Because when we do unwholesome deeds, the pro- we, we are going to have to reap the, the fruit. We are going to have to suffer for that. You know, what is the person that we are finding fault with, the person we are blaming, just because we think, we, they don't agree with, oh, just because we don't agree with their point of view, is an Aryan. Now what happens? That's all Aryapur. Now deal with that. How do we know? Just because someone becomes a Sotapana, does it mean that they will stop shouting? They will stop getting angry? No, remember Mahanama? We used to go to the Buddha and ask him three times, on three occasions he wanted reassurance from the Buddha. The first time he went and said, Lord Buddha, you say that I'm a Sotapanna, I'm not so sure. When I'm at work, I get really angry with my employees and sometimes I shout at them. When I see that they don't do their work properly, I scold them, I yell at them. And when I'm doing that, sometimes I feel, good Lord, I, feel, I, get, I get so agitated, so angry, that if I die at that point, I'm going to go straight to the hells. What did the Buddha say? No, Mahanam, you have become a Sotapan. You will never go to the hills ever again. If you say so, and he goes, and he comes back again. And he comes back again, a third time. On the third occasion, the Buddha reassures him finally and says, Mahanam, if, the, if a Buddha were to ever make a statement like that, If I were to look at that tree over there and say that that tree is going to be be standing there for another hundred years without any hurt or damage, just because the Buddha has uttered that, that will be the case. Mahanama, that is a tree. I am today speaking to a person, a human being like yourself. You will never go to the hell no matter what you do. So that was the final assurance that he needed. So you see, so anyone could be shouting, they could be you know, acting like 
what we you know what people might see on the, on the media. Be very careful because you don't know who they are. And remember, even you know, if a dog is a bodhisattva, what about a human being? Let's not mess with bodhisattvas. Let's not mess with the wrong people. Sometimes they don't know who they're messing with. Right? When people come on the media and they start pointing fingers at other people and they're shouting, shouting at them, right? Trying to destroy their character, their personality and all that. They don't know who they're messing with. Well, let's not us get into the same boat. So, let's come back to the, the qualities that we were speaking of. Anjali Karaneya. So, Jali Karaneya is to dissolve, is to it's to be like water, to, to, to not be solid but to be soft. And in being soft, the clenched fist, you now start to release and extend these fingers. And now it's with extended fingers that you go in front of the Mahasangha, put these fingers together, and then you worship. Because you don't worship like that, do you? No, you worship like that. This is an oath. This is an oath to say, just like I have today extended my fingers, each of these fingers represents unwholesome deeds, an unwholesome deed that in my past I used to do. But today I don't come to you in like this, I come to you like this. Having let go of those unwholesome deeds, and I make a promise that I will no longer engage myself in those unwholesome, unlatorious deeds. That is a promise. For whose benefit? For the benefit of the person you are worshipping? No, for your own benefit. So when you worship, who, who gains from that? Think about it. Who gains from a, from, a, from a worship? Yes, yourself. So then tell me, does the Buddha have to be here in person for you to go and worship? Because sometimes people speak of idol worshipping. Are Buddhists idol worshippers? Some people ask. The Buddha is not here in person, so why bother? Some people ask, Who are you benefiting by worshipping? The Buddha? No, yourself. Because what are you doing? This is a solemn oath. Venerable, the most venerable Buddha, the supremely enlightened one. I come in front of you, I reflect on your great qualities. From the moment you became a Buddha, the unmeritorious deeds didn't come, any, you know, didn't come anywhere near your mind. I want to get there myself. And I make a solemn promise to you, I will be mindful of my thoughts, my speech and my actions, such that I do not engage in the unmeritorious deeds ever again. The quality that you have within you, I make a promise to instill within myself. Andhabhava Vaikarna. I am blind to some of the qualities that you have today. But I will work towards becoming knowledgeable about your qualities. And then those qualities that I have now become knowledgeable of, I will start to instill within myself. That is the mark of a worship. This has nothing to do with, he is greater than me, he is wealthier than me, he is older or she is older than me. I am not saying, by the way, don't go and worship your, ma- your parents and grandparents from here on. You know, one might think, well actually, you know what, I am a Sotapanna, my aunt is still a Buddha Jan. I don't need to worship her. Do you know that, Venerable Sariputta, Every day before he went to bed, what did he do? Who did he worship? Asaji Maharaja Mahasaya. This is the chief disciple of the Buddha. Worshipping whom? His teacher. Is there anyone in the Buddha's Shasane who is more wise than the most venerable Sariputta? More than the Buddha? No. There is no one between the Buddha and the most venerable Sariputta. There is no one. Not even Asaji Maharaja Mahasaya. So think about it then. And yet he's worshipping. Why? Because he's worshipping the qualities of the teacher. What a great teacher you were. You, you as a teacher help show me the path. So worship your teachers. And then think about the qualities that they have. Worship your parents. As you worship them, think about the qualities that they have. Now, uh, let me ask you then, can you not worship a dog? Doesn't the dog have qualities that we don't have? Remember I spoke to you about this some time ago? You can worship a dog. I mean, don't do this in public. I mean, you don't have to do it at all. But, uh, you know, it's just a point to think about. And again, worshipping is not... You don't have to physically get into, the, into a position to worship. 
You don't have to get onto your knees and put your hands together. That is a token. That's just a, that's just a visualization of, of worshipping. But a worship is something that you do in your mind. Every day when I come here, I sit here, I look at you. And you come and tell me stories of how you have changed, your lives have changed with the, when the Dhamma has come into your lives. You don't see me doing it, but I worship you. When you see a Swami Mahant and how you get on your knees, how you bring your hands together. And when I can see how much faith you have within yourself, how much energy, how much effort that you make to come and do things like this. You don't see this, but I worship each and every one of you in my mind. I worship my parents in my mind. But if the world sees me in a robe, getting down in front of my parents who are in lay clothes, now that's not suitable. That's not appropriate. Because that's the way of the world. The way of the world is one. The way to Nibbana is another. Anya hilabu panisa, Anya nibbhana gamini. So we live in a world that we came to ourselves. We got here. No one asked us to come here. We got here. So now we have to play by the rules of the game. Therefore, there are marks of worship. There are, there are, there are positions. There are places. There are ways that you can worship where it's acceptable. Then there are others where it's not acceptable. Then, you know, let's say you're on a train. You're on a train, you see someone who's a... Uh, you, know, you see a monk on a train. It's a packed train. What are you going to do? Hey everyone, get out, get out, move, move. I need some, play, I need some room to worship this monk. Are you going to do that? No, that's not appropriate. That's not suitable. Not for that occasion, not for that place. But in your mind, of course you can. Of course you can. So this mark of respect is really a promise. It's, a, it's an oath that you're taking to instill these qualities within yourself. So that is Anjali Karaniya. How are we doing for time? Is it 6.30 you want? Now 6? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll give you another one. Then there's another quality called the Dakineya. So, you know, this goes in reverse order, right? We started with Anuttaram Punyakirtan, Anjali Karaniya, then Dakineya. But when you recite it, you go Dakineya, Anjali Karaniya, Anuttaram Punyakirtan, Lokasar. Dakineya. So the conventional meaning of the word Dakineya <coughs> is suitable for receiving offerings. Worthy of receiving offerings. So worthy of receiving gifts, food, the four requisites. Food, clothing, shelter and medicine. Okay? Dakineya. Again, I accept that. No qualms about that. No rejecting that, that is, that is all good. Yes, the Maha Sangha is very, extremely worthy of receiving that. You know, in the Dakkina Vibhanga Sutra, the analysis of alms or, or, or offerings, the Buddha speaks of how meritorious it is to make offerings to the Maha Sangha. Remember, even when Maha Prajapati came and off, tried to offer a robe to the Buddha <coughs> in recognition of the fact that she was his... Uh, stepmother who brought the, the prince up when he was young in recognition of that he, she, she prepared a robe and came and offered it to, tried to offer it to the Buddha on which occasion what did the Buddha say? Sange Hide Gotami Gotami instead of offering this to me offer it to the Mahasangha again he had to say it three times and on the third occasion Ananda Tero comes and asks Swami so, you know, Nanda, why do you do this? You know, it's with a lot of respect and a lot of love that Maha Prajapati Gautami has come here and she wants to offer this robe to you. Like, just like a mother would. What does the Buddha say? Ananda, there is no person, no being, in this entire universe who knows the qualities of a mother than I do. No one. It is because I know the qualities of a mother that I want to make this offering that Prajapati Gautami is making the best that she can make. I want her to be able to <coughs> reap the greatest rewards from making this offering, from everything that she has done. This is why I ask, I instruct her to make this offering to the Mahasangha. Because the Sangha includes the Buddha. 
the Sangha includes the Buddha and all the members of the Maha Sangha right from in the past, in the present and the future so Dakkineya or rather, yes, Dakkineya there are two meanings here which are important in our journey to Nibbana and I'll explain both of them to you now of course we've talked about the conventional meaning but here's the more profound deeper meaning okay? there are two which are both important now you may have heard that in the Buddha Shasana when we talk about giving alms there are two types of giving that we have learned even at school there is Amisa Puja and Pratipati Puja and of course we have learned that it's Pratipati Puja which is the better Puja which is the better kind of offering and Pratipati is nothing other than the conduct that we do our own conduct do we conduct our speech, body and mind in the way that the Buddha has taught us that is the best gift that's the greatest offering that we can make to him and so we have come to learn then that Amisa Puja is everything else flowers, food, incense, oil lamps, everything else that's all Amisa Puja, clothes, this, this is what we've come to learn but there's a meaning behind the word Amisa if you give some food, let's say to your pet dog what's the best the dog can do? What does the dog use this food for? To play, to run about, to do dog things. Does a dog do man things? No, a dog does dog things. So the best that the dog can do with the food that you've given it is dog things. Can the dog use that food, the energy that the dog is going to receive to practice the Noble Eightfold Path? How about meditate? What about observe still? No. The dog can't do any of that. Ah, misa. Ah. This is something that, this is a sound that we make when we give something to someone, right? In Sinhala. Ah. Ah, kila dinna. Ah, snigga. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ki ki dinna misak. Ah, pahu. Eking labina deyakne. Eking ganna deyakne. Ah. You make that offering. Here. Take it. Here. Here. You give it to the recipient, but there is really nothing that the recipient does using what you have given that is worthy of what it is that you have given them. You have given the animal food, but what can the dog do? Nothing other than dog things. Can the dog use that food to do great things? No. But what about the Mahasangra? If you go into a temple and offer alms to the, to the monks or nuns, or, you know, it doesn't have to be monks and nuns. You know, when you go to the, uh, the temple, let's say it's on a poya day, and there are people who observe still, now you offer alms to them. What are they using the, the food, the energy that they receive from the food for? To fulfill the Noble Eightfold Path. Brahmacharya. To fulfill the Noble Eightfold Path. So the food that you are using, that you have, or you are offering them, is not ah and then ah misa nothing ah kila deno misa vena karana de akne that does not apply when you give this food to someone who is a member of the Mahasangha and Sangha is not just monks and nuns okay not just bhikkhu bhikkhini upasaka upasika also includes Mahasangha so what about people like yourself have you not now dedicated your lives to practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Remember I asked you some time ago, are there any of you who made it their goal to become a Sotapanna by the end of the year? And I think I saw a few arms go up. So aren't you Upasakas then? If you are engaged in this process of putting a stop to Bhava, which is existence, are you not a Bhikkhu? I'm glad I'm doing this sermon in English. Because not many people live into that. So I'm free to speak. So you are also Upasaka and Upasaka. So if someone gives you a meal, if someone gives you clothes, if someone gives you a glass of water, you know, particularly if you, you know, while, when you are here, you walk into this room, you're sat down, you're waiting to listen to the sermon. So now someone gives you a bottle of water. Do you think that's an Amisa Puja? Because what are you going to use that water for? It's to do great things. To become a great person. That's not an Amisa Puja. Yes, traditionally, we have come to accept that, and conventionally, that's an Amisa Puja. 
you know, anything other than conduct of speech, body and mind, we have come to accept as Amisa. So, again, you know, when you go out in the world, do not speak of this. You know, when you go back into the outside world, what's an Amisa Puja? Offering food, flowers, oil lamps, incense, that's all Amisa Puja. Because remember, there is one language that we use to conduct ourselves in the world. These are transactions that we have with the world. Then there is another language that we use to attain Nibbana. They are not one and the same. It's the same words, but the meaning behind the words, the essence behind the words, it's entirely different. It has to be different. Otherwise, you know, Nibbana is one way, 180 degrees, the other way is the path to the world. 180 degrees. So any offering that you make to the Mahasangha, this is why I say again, when you take food to the arm, to the, to the temple, right? So let's say your local temple, you want to give an almsgiving there. You take the food there. Whenever you serve food either to a plate or an arms bowl, okay, right, good point. To ask you a question here. Just because an, a monk takes food in their arms bowl, are they more virtuous? Is a monk more virtuous because they take food in their arms bowl? Who are we to judge? Who are we to judge? Remember I asked you just because a monk is clad in red robes or maroon robes and not in saffron robes, is he more virtuous? No, how do we know? Because virtue is not something that we can see on the surface. It's a quality of the mind. So again, you know, you might come into our monastery and see monks going on arms, being served food, all types of food into the same bowl, right? Rice and curry and vegetables and you know, dessert and milk and everything into the same bowl. And you might think, whoa, now that's a good monk. Then you go into your local temple where that's not the way that the monks behave. Neither is right or wrong. So you go into a local temple and you see monks serving food onto a plate. Then you go, hmm, that's not a good monk. Who are you to judge? You're not even a monk in the first place. And I don't judge either. Who am I to judge? Because goodness and badness, ladies and gentlemen, are in the qualities. Good qualities and bad qualities, not in the kind of dish you eat your food in. Not in the way that you eat your food. Not what you eat together, none of that. Never judge somebody based on their outwardly appearances. Appearances will be always deceiving. Be very careful. Okay? So, coming back. Um, Amitra. So I was saying, you know, go to a local temple. When you offer, offer arms to the Mahasangha, never for a moment think that this is the local Hamadru that I know that I'm offering the food to in the temple. Because, you see, when that happens, that's when you go, you go to the, the chief monk and you offer it to him with both arms. Like this. With both arms you offer it to him. Then you get down on all fours and then you worship him three times to the chief monk. Then you go to the second monk in line. Again with both arms, but when you begin to worship him, two times. Then you go to the third monk in line with one arm. No worshipping this time. Then you go to the youngest, the novice monk who has only been ordained yesterday. And then you give the food to the monk and go, Bye. Or you peck him on the head. Our body hunger will come. As if you are, you are giving the food to an animal. You know, Guru Mahamudu says this is Darwinian evolution. Where it goes like this. You know, first you are on all fours worshipping the chief monk there, and then afterwards you, you stopped getting down on your knees, now you are half bending, and then one third bending, then one fifth bending, and now when you are the last monk, you are standing upright, and the monk has to bend to you. Why? Because you are worshipping who now? The person. How do you know which one is a Sautagman, which one is a Sakurdagami, which one is an Anagami, and which one is a Rahasan Mahansi? How do you know? Do you see the danger with judging people? So in our hearts, in our minds, it should always be Sariputta Maharatan Mahansi. It should always be Mahakasha Maharatan Mahansi. It should always be Mahamugalan Maharatan Mahansi. Whichever Rahatan Mahansi you like, read their books. 
There are lots of books written about their, their lives, their, how they live their lives. Read those books and then find a Rahatan Mahansi or a, or a, or a nun whose, whose character that you can really relate to. Make them your hero. Put a picture up on your wall at home. It's one of my visions that one day in Sri Lanka for all young people to have a picture of a Rathan Wansi on their walls. That's a vision that I have. I don't know if that will come true in my life, but it's a vision that I have. Have a picture of a Rathan Wansi on their wall. I don't mind that there's Sanat Jaya Surya and then there's Aravind Di Silva and there's Charu Khan next to it. That's okay. Well, that's a status. Get that picture up there. Then you can later on decide who goes in which order. The Sanat Jaya Surya come on top of the Rahatan Mahanse or he comes on top. You can decide that later. Once you start to read the books, begin to understand the Dhamma, then you, through the Dhamma you begin to see the Rahatan Mahanse. How do you see the Buddha? Exactly. That's how you see the, the Rahatan Mahanse as well. And for every young girl in Sri Lanka to have the picture of a Rahat Mahanin Mahanse, even if you can't find a picture, draw one. Once you've learnt about them, once you've read their books, you know, there will be a picture that comes in your mind. Draw it. <clears throat> it might just be with your pencil. That's okay. Draw it. Put the name under it and stick it on your wall. Now that person becomes your hero. Because when you have a hero, now what happens? Now you begin to imitate them. Now you become a follower. Isn't that why when Sanat Jayasura's picture went up on the wall, whenever a bat came into your hand, what did you do? You went for a sixer. You were in your bedroom. But you went for the sixer. You got the swing. Why? Because he's become your hero. I'm not saying don't make him a hero. That's okay. But what I'm saying is if you're on the path to Nibbana, then you need to find yourself some other heroes as well. So parents, maybe help your children do that. If that is who you want to see your children become, so that is Amitra Puja and Pratipatti Puja. So Dakineya, that was one meaning. The other meaning is Dakineya. Neya is the Nyaya, the method, the theory. And Dakineya is to see. To see the theory. To see the path. To see the method. To see the path to Nibbana. So who are we now making this mark of respect to? Those who have seen the path. That is, those who have become one of the noble eight. Sota Panna Marga Pala, Sakrudagami Marga Pala, Anagami Marga Pala, Arihat Marga Pala, Atta Purisa Puggala, Esa Bhagavato Savaka Sangha, Dakineya, Neya Dakka, Nyaya Dakka. Again, I will repeat this and emphasize this. These are meanings that will help you t- on your path to Nibbana. But when you speak with others, it's best that you stick to the conventional meanings, because otherwise you could get in trouble. Because people are not prepared to hear something that they have not heard for many years. People are not prepared to hear that. People are not prepared to listen to that. So don't try to give the Shabda Rupa that people don't like. What's going to happen then? What, what, what do people do when they receive Shabda Rupa that they don't like? Do they point the finger at them or to the outside world? Outside world. Because that's what they know. They don't know any other way. So they're going to point the finger at you. And when you're at the end of that finger, somebody's going to get hurt. And that somebody's going to be you. So don't get hurt. It's the wild, wild west out there. Okay? So that's Dakine, yeah, and so we've spoken about Anjali, Karni and Dakine. Then future sermons will speak about the other qualities and all the way up. Um, who were here yesterday to, for the English similar sermon? Anyone listened online? Okay, so a few of you. Um, so recently I had a chat with Guru Swami Nath about something. It was something that came to my mind as I was I, as I sat down for meditation and I shared that story with him which he shared with you yesterday so for those of you who weren't here yesterday I think there's something really interesting to take from that 
Imagine there are two people. Okay, so I want you to imagine now. Two people. You don't know either of them to any extent. It's just people. They're just people. Just any, you know, your average Joe. Okay? And, but one of them, every time you pass them by, they come and poke you. They're really begin really annoying. Whenever you pass them, they, they poke you. Or they hit you. They nudge you. They do something to hurt you physically. So there's one guy. The other guy, you know, he just minds his own business. Doesn't hurt you. It doesn't really bother you uh, one bit. He just minds his own business. It, you know, they, none of these two people know you. You don't, they're not acquaintances. You don't know them. But there's one guy who does what? Pokes you, nudges you, right? Hits you every now and then. And then the other guy, harmless, does nothing. Tell me, which of these two guys do you like more? The harmless one. The one that does not hurt you, right? Okay. Now, I want you to think of two rupas. Two sites. Okay, rupa, rupa. Whatever kind of rupa. Rupa, rupa, shabda, rupa, ganga, rupa, and so on. Two rupas. There's one type of rupa that really annoys you. Really bothers you. Pesters you. Frustrates you. Disappoints you. Makes you suffer. And then there's another rupa that does not do anything like that to you. Harmless does not bother you, does not annoy you. Very peaceful. Which of these two rupas do you like more? The one that doesn't? It's a riddle. Are you sure that you like the one that doesn't harm you the more? Are you sure that you like more the one that doesn't harm you? The one that doesn't bother you? Why does the one that bother you bother you? Why does the one that frustrates you, disappoints you, frustrates and disappoints you? Because you like it. Because you are attached to it. The rupa that doesn't bother you, the rupa that doesn't frustrate you, make you angry, distresses you, is because of what? There is no attachment to it. Exactly. But when you think about the, the two people, one hurts you, you don't like that guy. The other doesn't hurt you. You like that guy better. But when it comes to Rupa, Shabda, Gandha, Rasa, Sparsha, the ones that hurt you, you like better. Bonkers. That's mad. Well, the matter of the fact is that it's because we are attached to it, it's because we like it that it bothers us in the first place. Not the other way around. You don't like it because it bothers you. But be, as soon as you start attachment to it, then it starts bothering you. So really then, if you don't like it bothering you, if you don't like it annoying you, if you don't like it frustrating or disappointing you, there's only one thing you need to do. Hmm? Yes. See? How are you with that? Ten. He gets it. Stop attachment. Because the moment you stop attachment, it just becomes a nobody. Doesn't care. Just like the other Rupa. It's just like the other person who didn't bother you, who didn't annoy you, who didn't anger you. So, isn't attachment again, once again, every time we look at this problem, isn't it attachment every single time? This is why I said, it's, we are so lucky, so fortunate that we've only got one problem to fix. That's attachment. Unlike your broken car, unlike your broken house, I dare to say unlike your broken marriage, there's only one problem that needs fixing. Now, talking about broken marriages, see, I, I, I really want to help people understand that the problem is not in the outside world. This is why I bring up all these examples. Nothing is, right? Okay, I don't have anything against people who are couples or anything like that. I really don't. I genuinely don't. Okay? But I want you to think about this. Let's say there's a, there's a couple, married, okay? And the woman becomes annoying to this man. Not physically, but she always causes this man mental distress, frustration and makes him angry, okay? Not physically. So there's no physical harm, no physical abuse, no physical violence going on in that relationship, but mentally, everything you can imagine. Tell me, what does this man begin to consider doing? Starts with B. Yes. 
<laughs> Even he knows it. How do you know that? He starts to consider what? Divorce. Who is he trying to divorce now? The woman, right? But what was the cause for suffering? What should he be divorcing then? Attachment. People always try to fix the wrong problem. Until you begin to see the Dhamma is always the wrong problem you are trying to fix in the hope that you are going to be happy after that. Because the problem was not with the woman. If she wasn't attacking you physically, then of course yes you have to distance yourself. But if it wasn't physical abuse and it was all mental abuse, then attachment was the problem. So it's, uh, it's the attachment that you have to divorce, not the person, not the woman. So if ever the, you, you brought to me a couple who were having a difficult relationship and I was expected to talk to them, what would I say now? Yes, go for a divorce. Straight away. And then they look at me dumbfounded. After which point I'll say, oh no, no, not what you thought. <laughs> I didn't mean divorce the wife, I meant divorce attachment, sir. Because it's attachment that brings you suffering. Isn't this what Buddha taught us? Isn't that what he said? Divorce your attachment to all conditioned things. Because every time we find ourselves attached, we find ourselves suffering. Dukkha, dukkha, vipranama, dukkha and sankara, dukkha just keeps coming at us like the waves of the ocean. One after the other. One after the other. Yesterday, um, there was also something else that Guru Swami wanted to mention and I'll mention that, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that point up to you and I want you to, this is, this is something you're going to have to think about. Uh, it's something you're going to have to reflect on because it might be a little bit subtle, a little bit heavy. But I want you to leave you with something because you know, you're regular listeners now and I think you have the, you're, you're, you're ready to, for me to share some of these things with you. These are conversations we have on the, on the, in the Valley Manuva. You know, when I when he gets up from meditation, when I get up and we have that occasional chat, and I tell him, Guru Swami, this is what I I had a thought about this. What do you think? And he tells me, I had a thought like this. What do you think? And we have a conversation. Oh God, I love that. I am so blessed. I can't begin to say how fortunate I am to be at his feet. Yesterday I said. It is at your feet that one day I am going to become an Arahat and I know that. I am so blessed. Anyway, again, we are talking about the Dhamma here. Why am I blessed to be by his side? Because he gives me what? The Dhamma, nothing else. That's why I am blessed. Why are we blessed to be in the Buddha Shasana? What did we get from the Buddha? The Dhamma, nothing else. It's because of that we are blessed. That's why he is called the Blessed One. Because he's giving us what? The Dhamma. Okay? So, uh, so we're speaking of Dukkha Dukkha, Iparanama Dukkha and Sankara Dukkha. Remember the other day, I think we spoke about the, cho- uh, the chocolate cake. And I explained to you that a conversation I was having with one of the novice monks who was telling in his, in his own words how he thought that Dukkha Dukkha was or the, the, the suffering that we experience is where a piece of chocolate cake is not the same taste like the, the one we had before. And then we, you know, I had this conversation with him and say, well actually, the last time you went to eat chocolate cake, was it not, did it not taste exactly like the one before that? You know, two, the same chocolate cake from two shops, cut them, have a slice and they'll both taste exactly the same. You won't be able to tell the difference. Okay? So that's not where the problem is then. So Dukkha Dukkha then really is something that arises the moment attachment comes into the picture. The moment attachment comes into the picture, Dukkha Dukkha arises. In the example of the chocolate cake, the moment that you get this view that Drishtiya, chocolate cake is a nice thing, it's a delicious food, it's something that you have to eat, something you have to get your hands on. The moment this view comes into your, into your mind, now you're in a state of vexation. You haven't eaten it yet. You don't know what it looks like. You don't know what it tastes like. You don't know what it feels like. You don't know anything about it. But you're going to go looking for what now? 
chocolate cake. It's like when you hear someone speak of something and then you go on Google and type it in. You, know, you don't know what it's like. You've never seen it. You don't know whether it's black or white. But you type it in Google, now you're trying to find what is this thing that I'm looking for. But the moment that I have planted this seed that chocolate cake is a nice thing, it's a good food, it's, it's nice to eat. Now, you're in a state of vexation. Why? Because attachment has now arisen in your mind. Dukkha Dukkha starts from the word go. It's like rolling the dice. From the point those, those dice have been released from your hand, Dukkha Dukkha starts. If the point of letting go is point of attachment, from that point forward, Dukkha Dukkha has, atta- has arisen. That Dukkha Dukkha is now with you and your, your sentiments will be along something along the lines of will I be able to find it? Will I be able to know what it tastes like? Where should I go and find it? Where should I go and look for that? Will I be able to buy it? Will I, do I have enough money to get it? These feelings of agitation, these uneasy feelings because you want to now go and find, you want to go and experience this chocolate cake. Imagine you've never eaten it before. Right? So that's that's what, you, what I want you to imagine. So now you want to go and find it. This is all Dukkha Dukkha. So, Dukkha Dukkha is not something that we can, we can we enjoy. Anyone here enjoy Dukkha Dukkha? No. So, because we don't enjoy Dukkha Dukkha, we now have to do something to relieve ourselves from the Dukkha Dukkha. Not redeem, relieve. Like the man going into the hospital with a broken leg and shouting at the staff. This is relieving. How does one redeem themselves from Dukkha Dukkha? Of chocolate cake? He's never eaten chocolate cake before. How do you do this then? Sir? It doesn't taste good. Okay. What else? No, you haven't. You don't have the opportunity to taste it. Hmm? Forget about it. <laughs> Think about this for a moment. Mm-hmm. But the problem with trying to forget is again, you're going to be reminded of it again. And what do you do then? Because like I said, you can't put brakes on, on thoughts. They just keep coming. They just keep flowing. And if, if something that is, if, a, if a seed has been planted in your head that says something is good and someone says that, then someone comes along and says, actually, you know, that's not all that good. Now you're not sure. Now you really want to know what it's like. So you can make up your own mind. Hey, this guy says it's good, that guy says it's not good. Now I have to go and test it out for myself. Think about this. You know how some, you know, this, uh, this bhavana that we do, pinnacle uh, bhavana. I can't remember the English word for that. I'll go and find it. How, you know, we've been, over a long period of time, you know, we think about kes, hair. And we think about the detesting nature of, and the, the repulsive nature of hair. That's how we've been doing it. Hair is very repulsive. The skin is very repulsive. Our teeth is very repulsive. This is what we think. Well, if hair is so repulsive, why do you keep it on your heads? Get rid of it. Is it repulsive? Madam, is your hair repulsive? How about you, madam? If it is, why do you spend such a long time combing and washing and brushing and going to the salon? If it's so repulsive? What about your teeth? Is it repulsive? How, how often do you go in front of the mirror and you know, give yourself a good smile and think, Oh, lovely teeth. What about your skin? Is it repulsive? Is that why you apply creams and you keep your, your skin so lovely and soft? Is that why you, you approach another person and touch them? Is, it, is that because skin is repulsive? So, we'll come back to that on another day. So, as I said, I want you to think about this, right? This is something to think. I'm not going to give you all the answers. It's time we all started to think. I can't give you all the answers. But let's come back to the chocolate cake. Likewise, if someone has already planted the seed in our head to say that something is good, then the answer to that is not somebody else coming and planting another seed to say, no, actually, it's not that good. If we are not prepared to analyze it ourselves, because otherwise you're just taking it for hearsay. He said it, so I'll take it. The other person said it, oh, I'll take it as well. 
Now this is all taken by faith. But do we not know that no matter what object we talk about in this world, in this entire universe, everything is Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vinyana. Once you've got to the understanding that all types of Rupa, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, is there any kind of Rupa that does not belong to that category? Any kind of Vedana that does not belong into that category? No, we are talking about all kinds of Rupa, all kinds of Vedana, all kinds of Sanya, Sankara and Vinyana. The point I'm trying to get here is that we don't need to have experienced everything in the world and then to reflect on them being Anicca because otherwise you know, we'd be here all day. Imagine that, if we had to go and eat every kind of food there is to then reflect on the fact that it's Anicca You know, not in the, next, in the next trillion births will we attain Nibbana. This is why when we reflect on Anicca on all conditioned things, we have to accept, well, through, through our, our intelligence, we, we understand that this is not just unique to one kind of Rupa. This is the case for all Rupa. Universally, all rupas are anicca. Universally, all vedana are anicca. Universally, all sanya, sankara, vinyana are anicca. What does anicca mean again? In this sense, udavi vaivi. As long as the causes exist, they will arise. When the causes pass away, it will cease to exist. So, is the problem then that the world is anicca? Is that the problem? We spoke about this last week. It's the problem that the world is anicca. What's the problem? Attachment, indeed. Very good. I'm very pleased to hear that. It's ignorance, sir, yes. It's ignorance. So, through ignorance, and ignorance is what? Ignorance tells us that actually it's through our attachment that we can find happiness. Through indulgence in sensuality that we can find happiness. Through indulgence in Rupa, Shabda, Gandha, Rasa, Sparsha, that we can find happiness. That is what ignorance tells us. But wisdom tells us, no, 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 no. Attachment does not bring happiness. Attachment will always bring you suffering. Like we've been talking about throughout today. Wherever you look, at the end of that, the, the root is going to be at attachment if, it's, if it ends at suffering. Okay? So, when we reflect on Rupa, you know, sometimes some of you may sit down to meditate. Perhaps maybe five, ten minutes a day. You don't need to have experienced all types of rupa to reflect on rupa is anicca. Because we take this as rupa skandha. What is rupa skandha? Aggregates. These are total, this is everything, all types of rupa. Otherwise, how do you know that the rupa in the Brahma worlds are anicca? When are you going to find that out? You're going to have to go to the Brahma world first. When is that going to happen? See, this is the problem. So, this is the thing, you know. Once you understand that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and addition, the, this addition is nothing other than the total of the two numbers, do you have to then add all the different types of numbers in this world to know that that's how addition works? What about multiplication? If you are able to multiply two numbers and then you get the theory behind it, you get the method behind it, do you then have to multiply all the numbers there, is, there are in this world to, then, to understand this is how multiplication works? No, because that's the method. Once you've gotten the method, everything is the same. So therefore, when we talk about Anicca Dukkha Anatta, yes, we do speak of Rupa Anicca, Vedana Anicca, but what we are actually meaning here is Rupa Skanda. All types of Rupa universally. Anicca. So whether that's Rupa in the human world, Rupa in the Brahma world, Rupa in the Deva world, Rupa in the Apayas, wherever, all types of Rupa, Rupa, Shabda Rupa, Gandha Rupa, Rasa Rupa, Sparsha Rupa, Dhamma Rupa, all of that is Anicca. Why? Because they're all conditioned, unconditionally conditioned. So come back to the chocolate cake then. When we are experiencing this Dukkha Dukkha, which is how do I get this, where can I find this? Now we do Sankara. When we start to do Sankara, the reason that we are doing this Sankara is because we can't bear the pain of Dukkha Dukkha. Because we can't bear the pain of Dukkha Dukkha, we start to do Sankara. And the Sankara is nothing other than the process of going and finding ways and means and methods to acquire what it is that we now desire. This is the process of acquisition. 
of what it is that you now desire. The things that you do behind it. So there will be Mano Sankara, Vachi Sankara and Kaya Sankara. Again Abhisankara. Okay? So Sankara is a generic term. Abhisankara. Because this is the self that we are trying to preserve. Abhisankara. Okay? So that's all Abhisankara. So this Abhisankara again is Dukkha. This is why when I asked anyone here likes to cook and you know you came back with the answer well if you were to be taken to an almshouse you would not enjoy cooking there. So then we understand that Abhisankara is not something that we enjoy doing. But we are happy to do it on the basis that it's something that's going to help us relieve ourselves from Dukkha Dukkha. It's only on that basis that we are happy to do that. Nothing else. I remember the other day when I, when I uh, got a chance to have a conversation with my ex-wife who obviously went on, went, went on to become a Mehrin Mahante I, I, I told her I am so glad, I am so fortunate that you let me ordain because had it not been for you who gave me the permission to, to come and do this Today, this night, I'll be ironing my work clothes. And I remember the pain that I had to go through for that. Every night I remember the clothes you used to come, because there, you know, you, you, in most places in the UK, you know, you, you can't really put your clothes out. Uh, because, one, there's not enough sun, particularly in the, in the winter, so you have to use the dryer. And usually what happens when you put your clothes in the dryer, <laughs> for those of you who have experienced that, it comes out all crushed. And then you have to spend an entire life ironing out the wrinkles. So I remember getting myself a spray of wa- uh, water and then spraying on the shirt and ironing this one shirt which I was only going to wear for one day. I would sometimes iron for one and a half hours, two hours. So that day when I got to have a conversation, I just reminded that from somewhere it just came to me and I said, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Because otherwise tonight I would be ironing my work shirts. So you see, I, don't, I didn't like ironing. I didn't enjoy ironing. But it was something I was prepared to do. Why? Because that would help me relieve myself from Dukkha Dukkha. The Dukkha Dukkha was, do I have something to wear to work tomorrow? I can't go in my sarong. So I need a shirt, I need a tra- pair of trousers. So that Dukkha Dukkha I was able to relieve by ironing. Or, you know, if, I were, if it was crushed, I couldn't wear that to work because people are going to then start wondering what's wrong with this guy. So I had to iron my clothes, right? So that's all Abhisankara Dukkha that I'm prepared to do to relieve myself from. Dukkha Dukkha. Then the moment comes where you do this Abhisankara Dukkha, you continue to do this and do this and do this and eventually you give rise to what it is that you were attached to. Again, this is a Chitta that has now risen. Nothing else. What, are we, what else are we giving rise to? Chittas. Right? That's how we en- en- enjoy it. That's where we find pleasure. In this thought process. So this thought has now, through our efforts, arisen. And at that point where it has arisen, we have now been able to bring together the Rupa Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vijnana, the Panchaskanda, to give rise to the Panchaskanda that we were attached to. That is the Sankate that we have now given rise to. So again, this is a little bit heavy, but this is something that you can think about and reflect on over the next week. This is the Sankate that we have now given rise to. By doing what? Abhisankara. On for what? To relieve ourselves from dukkha dukkha. So through the process of Abhisankara we have now given rise to that point where what we were attached to we have now produced into this world. And this world is the, the mental world I'm talking about, right? This is the pleasure land. Pleasure land. Okay? And you know, if you listen to the sermons, you know what pleasure land is. So we've given rise to that. Now, at that moment, no more Sankara Dukkha. No more Sankara Dukkha. Why? Well, you've now produced what it is that you wanted through your efforts. No more Sankara Dukkha. From that point forward, starts what Dukkha? Viparinama Dukkha. Because what you have now given birth to, now starts to decay. Now starts to, de- now starts to cease. 
Why? Because the causes that gave rise to that point have now gone into change, into flux. And when they start to go into a state of change, what it is that we brought into this world, what we produced, that bhava, that jati that we produce, see, jati happens not just next birth. This is jati in every moment, in every chitta. Ita pachya patachya samutpada. In every moment, every chitta, this is a patachya samutpada process that runs. So now that which is that which we brought into this world, that we gave jati to, now that starts to go into viparinama. And now we have to endure the pain of viparinama dukkha. Now, you see, before you started, there was dukkha dukkha. From the point where attachment came. Before attachment came, was there any dukkha? No, but was there ever a point like that in uh, samsara? No, there will be a point in the future. But in the past, there was no such point. There has always been attachment. So there has always been what? Dukkha Dukkha. Let's take the example of the chocolate cake. You don't know of chocolate cake. But today I tell you, I speak to you about chocolate cake. Now, the moment you hear about chocolate cake, the moment that the Drushti Vipalyasa comes in, this view comes in, this distorted view comes in that through chocolate cake I can make myself happy, I can give birth to Natasha, now what happens? Dukkha Dukkha has arisen. So total number of Dukkha? One. At that point. From that point forward, now you start to do Sankara. Has the Dukkha Dukkha disappeared? No, it's still there. So that from the point you start to do Sankara, now how many Dukkhas? Two. Now they start, they, so the Dukkha Dukkha goes on increasing, increasing and increasing. Up until the point where you get that point where you have now produced, given birth, that, given Jati, to that moment of pleasure, Ashwada Matre, that moment of pleasure. At that point, total number of Dukkha. Is there Sankara Dukkha any longer? No. Is there Viparinama Dukkha yet? No. What about Dukkha Dukkha? What about Dukkha Dukkha? Sir? Still prevails? That, so that's one, one response there. What do you, what do you think? I'm getting, I'm getting mixed answers. Some say yes, some say no, some say maybe. Hmm. What was it that gave right to Dukkha Dukkha? I'll give you the formula. A world that is anicca, product, attachment. One of these two has to change to a zero. Or both has to change to a zero for the, re- for the answer to be zero. Has attachment gone away? Is the world not anicca any longer? It's still anicca. There's still attachment. There's still anicca. You still have one. There's still dukkha dukkha. Now, that's one school of thought. Again, I'm not, I'm, uh, like I said, this is for the advanced listeners who have been coming along for some time and I want you to think about this, okay? Because I was discussing this again later on yesterday with Guru Amru as well, uh, after, after the sermon. That's, that's one uh, theory. This is all for theory, okay? <laughs> you don't need to know how many Dukkhas are there in the Chitta. For as long as there's attachment, there's dukkha. That's all we need. But this is for the advanced listeners, for the advanced people who like to think about this. That's one. There's also this way you could look at this. The moment that you have given rise to what it is that you have produced, at that point, your, your view of the world is what? Anicca or nicca? Nicca. At that point of, that, that moment of pleasure, now your view of the world is that it's nicca for that tiny moment. So going back to the formula, attachment still exists, but now you are attached to a world that is nicca. Therefore zero times one equals zero. Now, this is something I want you to think about. I think we'll discuss this again in following weeks, because I'm still debating this in my mind, but you know, again, for the advanced listeners, for those of you, I, I want you to help me as well. This is a two-way thing. 
why 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 one mind when we have the luxury of many you know you're all people who've been listening to sermons for a long time so you you can all help us here yes ma'am. Hmm? yes so this is this is my my point here where as long as attachment is there i believe that it's impossible for us to say that there's a point where there is no dukkha because otherwise we are saying what we are saying is there's attachment but there's a point where there is no dukkha so this is relief sir where the sankara dukkha no longer prevails so where sankara dukkha has now been diminished that lowering of the dukkha from the from 2 to 1 we experience as being pleasure that's relief from that is relief from sankara dukkha from from dukkha dukkha however the thing is like you know you are in the shirt but what might happen to the shirt now now you have the shirt let's say you bought a car you go through a lot of trouble to buy the car now you have the car nothing's happened to the car yet but in your mind aren't you thinking what might happen to this car even before you drive out onto the road did you have a comment sir okay so i want you to think about this okay reflect on this and see what you can make of it so either way at the point where we have now been able to experience that point of pleasure no more sankara dukkha we are all clear about that there is no doubt about that but from that point forward viparnama dukkha starts and then that continues all the way until the end of that thought cycle now once viparnama dukkha is at its greatest so what is the dukkha dukkha while viparnama dukkha is there while sankara dukkha was there while we are giving rise to this the dukkha dukkha was will i be able to produce this despite all my efforts will i still, will i be able to make this will i be able to uh, reap fruit will i be able to buy this car you know i'm i'm working i'm saving money but again in the back of your mind you're thinking will i be able to buy that car will someone else going to buy that car will i have the model that i like you know all that is dukkha dukkha what about the dukkha dukkha while it's going through viparna will i be able to stop this how can i stop this how can i stop the viparna that's the dukkha dukkha there but despite all that it goes through viparnama and it comes to a, it, it ceases to exist but at that point you can't bear the pain of the viparnama dukkha so what do you do again again sankara dukkha so again as i said that was a little bit heavy but i it came with a warning but now i want you to think think intelligently use the dhamma that you've learned in the past and let's see what we can come up with because there can't be two answers in the buddhist teaching there can only be one right answer so uh, this is what i'm going to be thinking over the next few days and i would like you to join me as well so if at the point where we experience that point of pleasure is the total number of dukkha zero or is that dukkha dukkha still there that's what that is yes so that's that's one argument whereas the other argument is well now you have given rise to what it is that you were in the state of dukkha dukkha for so if that is that has now arisen would you still be a experience in the dukkha dukkha so there are again you know there there's, there's arguments to both sides both sides think let's not be hasty you can think over the next week and uh, and we'll come to a uh, we will we'll try and collate some responses next week and see what we get is that okay so this is again for those who like to investigate the dhamma perhaps you know there may be answers in the abhidharma but i don't want you to all to go now and turn in the pages of the abhidharma because there's more that we need to do in the uh, in the meantime it's only for those who enjoy studying the dhamma enjoy anal- analyzing the dhamma it was just an extra bonus additional bit of work if you like to do that but if not i'll come and give you the answer next week anyway okay so it's half past six i think we'll bring the sermon to a conclusion there all in all i think it's just always 
Be mindful, always know that it's attachment that brings suffering. Reflect on that every time, all the time. Remember, don't divorce the wife, divorce attachment. Then you'll be happy with the same wife. See, easy. Say again, sir. Attachment, attachment paves the way to all those things. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's uh, you know this is why in when you when you when you look at the Paricca Samuppada process, there's something called Anyamanya Paricca Samuppada. Where it's uh, complementary, it works both ways. Attachment leads to sankara, and the more sankara you do, the more you that the more it gives rise to attachment. Avidya pachya sankara, sankara pachya avidya. Really simple example. Let's say you see a girl, a young man sees a girl, starts to feel attracted to this girl but now it's just the sight of her through avidya now this attachment has a reason but now what does he do because he now starts to feel that pain, this vexation he wants to relieve himself from that so he tries to do the sankara kaya sankara vachi sankara mano sankara and through that sankara he now now goes and approaches the girl starts to have those conversations and now previously you were only attached to the sight now the sound now the smell the taste, the touch, and all that. So, avidya led to sankara, but now sankara has also led to more and more avidya. So, it works both ways. Mm-hmm. Um. So, there are people who will continue to do that. Clearly, I am not going to be doing that. But, and I understand why people say that. Because there has to be, you know, for, the, for, for Buddhism to prevail for the next two and a half thousand years, there, are, there have to be people who will build temples. There will have to be people who will go on in the Perahara. There has to be people who will bring arms to the monks. There has to be people... Because if everyone goes and becomes an Arahatan Mahanse, then there's not going to be anyone to take this for the next 5,000 years. I accept that. That's, that's beyond doubt. But the thing is, not everyone is capable of becoming an Arahatan Mahanse. So, the thing I would suggest is, whenever you do all the other things, like help build the nation and so on and so forth reflect on the fact that the reason I'm having to do this is, to, is, that, is because I'm still here and I'm doing this so that I can acquire enough merit so that one day I can become an Arahatan Master not to just continue existence not for the sake of doing it because you think when the, point, when the moment comes where we have to pay the consequences of the deeds that we've done, at that point we can't use any of these things as excuses. The fact that I've contributed to building the nation is not going to come and save me when it's time for me to go to hell, if I haven't become a Sotapanna. Remember, think of you know, Ashoka, the great king Ashoka. Right? How much service did he render to the Buddha Shasani? But at the point of death, the thought that came to him was not a good one. So where did that take him? To the hell. So did he not build the nation? Those are what, sorry? So, um, I'm not sure I'm going to say they're stupid ideas, but I'm going to say these are all things that people have come up with to help with existence. 
to, to help support and create the, fa- the framework, the fabric of existence. Because, you know, the way of the world is that we have to have our, difference, our differences. The way of Nibbana is there are no differences. It's all the same. This is why sometimes when, I, when we go outside with, with our young monks, I, I sometimes point out to them out the window and say, Swami look at those houses. Each of the houses that you pass by, you know, you, after, after they've looked at about four or five houses, I say, why are each of them different? And then they say, well, because, you know, they might have a different number of people at home. You know, one may be a, a, a doctor who might have a, a, a clinic at home. The other might have pets, so they need a kennel or something like that. The others might need a big kitchen. Others need a big bedroom, so on and so forth. So these are all differences. And I said, isn't it because of their differences, they are not able to live under one roof, all, five, all the people of all the five houses? It's because of their differences. It's because of their differences, they have built their homes in different ways. It's because of their differences, they can't all live under one roof. And as a result, five houses means five blueprints, five uh, engineers, five architects, five sets of con- contractors, five sets of bricklayers, five sets of uh, mason, ma- mason workers and so on and so forth so all this effort extra effort is because we have our differences and then I said well what about the Sanghavas that we all live in that only needed one architect that only needed one set of bricklayers that only needed one engineer because now we are Tadidi Vidipahakara Vidhi is a way. This is me, my my way, my way. My way or the highway, right? That's what we say, my way or the highway. So when you have a way that you have to maintain and sustain, then what you're saying is, I'm different to you, sir, so you and I, you know, I can't live with you. You're going to have to go and do your own thing. I'm going to do my own thing. But when you and I are the same, when it doesn't matter where you've come from, whatever walk of life you come from, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're black or white, whether you're male or female, then we're all Tavidi. Then it doesn't matter where we live. We can all live under one roof. But then there are others who become monks, become Tavidi, and then again they start to create differences between each other. That's a real shame. I'll tell you what the reason is. I insulted them. <laughs> yes. What else? What else? Kamma sakomhi kamma dayadu. Kamma yoni kamma bandhu kamma parisarna yang kamma karisami ti kalyanangwa papa kangwa tasadayadu bavisami. In the Dasadhamma Sutra, which is a discourse that the Buddha gave to all monks, and he said, every day, as monks, you have to reflect on these ten. And he speaks of ten principles. One of them is this what I, what I just recited there. Kamma Sakomi. All the vipakas that you receive are the causes of your own karma. If the Buddha said that, who am I to go and argue that? So because and let's say it's not let's say it's not like that it makes it easier for me to accept that it was the, the, the result of my own karma. Because then I have no one to get into conflict with. Because I did this unto myself. Besides, I am still experiencing those things because I am still here. Well, why am I here? If you don't like it, get the hell out of it. That's what I am trying to do. Remember, if you don't like the rules of the game, then stop playing the game. You can't change the rules of chess. If you don't like the rules of chess, then what should you do? Stop playing chess. So I don't like the rules of this game. This worldly existence, I don't like the rules. Where I have to bear the fruit of the, the deeds that I have done. I don't like that. I only like to bear the results of the good deeds that I have done. I don't like the results of the bad deeds I have done. But that's the rule of the game. I don't like that. So what should I do? Stop playing the game. That's what I'm trying to do. Stop playing the game. And, you know, I'll say this finally. 
to your earlier point where a lot of people say you know is it right for young people like yourselves to go and ordain and you know fulfill the buddha shasana and become arahat and one says what happens then you know we have to all be engaged in protecting the nation and you know this what we call jati jati rakagannu jati pavatvannu well if right what i remember is right 2500 years ago there was this person this this great man who said not jati pavatvannu jati nadikaran so that's what i'm trying to do jati nadikaran not jati pavatvannu because ultimately everyone's there to serve you but you have to eat alone everyone's prepared to serve but eat yourself i'm not prepared to eat the things that i serve myself so i have to stop playing this game ultimately i think we can all be happy if we stop pointing the finger out right one reason for that is that's not going to get us anywhere the second reason whenever you you look at people like that and you start to feel anger resentment towards them that's not going to help you you're only going to feel feelings of anger and you know and resentment and discontentment and frustration none of these are thoughts that are conducive to nibbana remember samma sankappa nikkama sankappa avyapada sankappa avihinsa sankappa so in samma sankappa there is no room for kama sankappa vihinsa sankappa and vyapada sankappa there is no room for that if i were to do that i am not practicing the noble eightfold path if that is the case i do not deserve to eat the food that you put on to my arms bowl let alone anything else why do you bring me arms to spread hate to spread anger to be spiteful of others or to practice the noble eightfold path why do you give me this robe why do you give me medicines why have you given me shelter i didn't bring any of these things you gave me all this why what did you ask me to do in return practice the noble eightfold path and what is samma sankappa again avyapad avihinsa nikkama this is the buddha's teaching i am not willing to stray from the buddha's path i am not willing to do that i have done that plenty times already not any more so if i eat what you give me i have to use what you give me for what you give me for the purpose you give me to me that's why otherwise i am indebted to you i am indebted to you and the buddha says if you eat what these supporters bring you your benef- the benefactors of the buddha shasana offer to you and you do not fulfill the noble eightfold path you might as well swallow bowls of fire is what the buddha says you might as well swallow bowls of fire if you do not practice the noble eightfold path as monks so then tell me if i were to spy ignite hate anger in other people i might as well swallow what bowls of fire not bowls of rice anyway so lots to think about think about what i asked you to think about as well uh, if you have the time for that and we'll talk more about that next week okay so i don't have the sheet for the ari maitri okay i've got one minute sorry the english one i think uh, this week if i'm is it the single one which one is it today English okay <coughs> may i and all beings in all worlds be freed from the fire of birth freed from the fire of decay freed from the fire of illness freed from the fire of death free from the fire of sorrow 
freed from the fire of lamentation, filled with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana, healed with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana, healed with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana. May I and all beings in all worlds be freed from the fire of suffering, freed from the fire of discontentment, freed from the fire of exhaustion, freed from the fire of disappointment, freed from the fire of clinging on to the five aggregates, Healed with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana. Healed with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana. Healed with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana. May I and all beings in all worlds be freed from the fire of, freed from the suffering of samsara. Freed from the disease of samsara, freed from the fear of samsara, freed from the flames of samsara, freed from the burning of samsara, freed from the sorrow of samsara, freed from the lust of samsara. Freed from the clutches of samsara, filled with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana, healed with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana, healed with the ultimate bliss of Nibbana. The karma worlds are in despair. May I and all beings be freed from the karma world. The Rupa worlds are in despair. May I and all beings be freed from the Rupa world. The Arupa worlds are in despair. May I and all beings be freed from the Arupa world. All worlds are in despair. May I and all beings be freed from all the worlds. Nibbana is the only salvation. May all beings attain Nibbana. Nibbana is the only salvation. May all beings attain Nibbana. Nibbana is the only salvation. May all beings attain Nibbana. Letting go is the only salvation. May I and all beings let go. Detachment is the only salvation. May I and all beings be detached. Being freed is the only salvation. May I and all beings be free. Nibbana is the only salvation. May I and all beings attain Nibbana. Nibbana is the only salvation. May I and all beings attain Nibbana. Nibbana is the only salvation. May I and all beings attain Nibbana. May I and all beings in all worlds be freed from the bondage of love, freed from the bondage of aversion, freed from the bondage of delusion, freed from the bondage of Mara. Healed with the eternal bliss of Nibbana. Healed with the eternal bliss of Nibbana. Healed with the eternal bliss of Nibbana. Healed with the eternal bliss of Nibbana.
Hear with the eternal bliss of Nibbana Hear with the eternal bliss of Nibbana Do you want me to give you just one more thing to take with you? It's an extra gift. You know, one of the biggest problems that we have is this ego. That we find ourselves struggling with every day. Ask yourself, at least from this point forward, looking back and reflecting on the past. You know, when you are expected to write your names some in some places, sometimes it fits it could be where you offer the alms to the temple and you write your name where they do the punyanamodana the uh, transferring of merits let's say you are a doctor do you find yourself writing the letters dr in front of your name let's say you are you are introducing yourself to somebody and the fact that you are a doctor means nothing in that conversation Let's say you go to the bank and you are depositing money for somebody else. It's not even your account. You're just paying into someone else's account. When the clerk asks, Yes sir, how can I help you? Oh, I'm Dr. So-and-so. Do you find yourself doing that? What does the fact that you're a doctor have to do with anything at that point in time? Except you feeding your own ego? Hmm. But again, that's a very good point, madam. Getting done, some, done, something done faster. What about the Punyana Modana? Sometimes I see that. You know, in, in the books that we receive where people write their names down to, to transfer merits. I'm not going to transfer merits any faster. I can only speak at the rate I speak. So the fact that you have DR written in front of your name doesn't mean I'm going to say it out any louder or any faster. Well, what about the the tea plucker in your village? I have never, never seen someone come and write down TP and the name in, after that. I've never seen a coconut plucker come and say, Oh, I'm coconut plucker so and so. Can you help me with this please? I need some gas in my car. I'm, I'm a chef. Oh, I'm chef so-and-so. Can you help me get this done? True. Today in society, people, you know, they've lost respect for qualities and values. They, today they respect titles, which is such a shame. That's the world we live in. So, ask yourself though, if whenever you write, because, you know, I, I have the privilege of speaking to an audience who are a very educated audience are a well-to-do audience and I have that privilege given that you know the medium that we use for these sermons is, is such. Ask yourselves, do you find yourselves using your title to feed your ego? Because now you're on a path to Nibbana. Worldly existence is one, the path to Nibbana is another. So if the reason you're writing your title there is to feed your ego, then I think you have some work to do. So think, that was just an extra bonus to take away with you. Uh, it's just to help. I have nothing against you doing that. I just want to help you. Because sometimes we don't know how we act, how we, uh, how we succumb ourselves to the ego that arises within us. Sometimes we are blind to that. So ask yourself, if you find yourself doing that to feed your ego, then is it something you should continue to do? Or is it time you put a stop to that? Okay. So with that, let's bring up the sermon to a conclusion. <clears throat> Before that, let us take a moment to transfer the merits that we have acquired today to all those who deserve these merits. First and foremost, once again, let us take a moment to reflect on the fact that it is because of the supremely enlightened one, the blessed one, the unvanquished one, the perfect one, we have this dharma today. <clears throat> and it is because he sacrifices life not just in its final birth but also in many countless yawns in samsara for the deliverance of all sentient beings that we have with Dhamma today and then it stands to the Bhikkhu Bhikkhu Nupasaka Pasikas who throughout their lives sacri- sacrifice their lives to protect and preserve the Dhamma protect and preserve the Tripitaka that we have 
the gift of Dhamma here with us today to practice, to understand and to comprehend and to deliver ourselves from samsara. So, may the merits that we have all acquired today be transferred to those bhikkhu bhikkhu nusapasikha pasikas who may still be caught up in the process of transmigration. If any of them have been born in the woeful plains, may this merits help them to be born in the blissful plains. For those born in the blissful plains, may this merits help them to abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble laid for path and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Also, let us take a moment to transfer merits to the members of the Mahasangha, the Mahanayakas, the Anunayakas and so on, as well as anyone, wherever they may be residing on this planet, if they are a member of the Mahasangha, may they all be able to rejoice in these merits. As well as that, let us take a moment to transfer merits to the Bhikkhu Bhikkhu Pasikasa, people just like yourself who have dedicated their lives, at least a portion of their lives, to practice in the path, to practice in the Noble Eightfold Path, to find liberation and freedom from samsara. And also, not just for your own benefits, not, for the, just, not just for their own self-benefits, but also, having understood the Dhamma, they have now started propagating the Dhamma, giving the gift of Dhamma to other beings for their deliverance, for their freedom, for their emancipation. May all these bhikkhu bhikkhu nisubha be also, also rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today. Also, let us take a moment to transfer these merits to the monks, who are, monks and nuns who are resident in your local temples and your local nunneries. Think for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, that although you are here today, you have come here, and you have the opportunity to listen to a sermon perhaps once a week. It is the monks and nuns in your local temples and nunneries who are always behind you, for, who are always with you through thick and thin, through rain and shine, who have always been there behind you through your ups and downs, helping your children with the dhampasa and so on and so forth. With every important event in your life, they've always been there to bless you. These are monks who also don robes to dedicate their lives to Nibbana, but today they have set aside time to help you prosper in your own worldly lives as well. So, let us transfer the, all the merits that we have all acquired today to them as well. If any of them have been born in the woeful plains, may through the power of these merits they be able to born in the blissful plains. And for those born in the blissful plains, may these merits help them to abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Also, let us take a moment to transmit to the Devas, Brahma, spirits, demons, and the dead that we invited at the start of this sermon. As well as that, let us take a moment to transfer these merits to all our ancestors and those who predeceased us, mothers, fathers, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews, brothers, sisters, and so on and so forth, as well as teachers who have shown us right, and right from wrong, not just in this birth, but in our previous births as well. Anyone and everyone who even provide us a modicum of support, help and assistance to be where we are today, to have become the successful people that you are today. Anyone and everyone who helped shape your, shape your lives to what you are today, may they all be able to rejoice in these merits. If any of them have been born in the woeful plains, may these merits help them to be born in the blissful plains. And also may these merits help them to abstain from the merit unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Also, let us take a moment to transfer merits to the members of the armed forces who sacrificed their lives to protecting and preserving our motherland. It is thanks to them that we are able to practice the Dhamma in peace and in harmony with everyone, people of all races, people of all religions and faiths, as well as the members of the police force, as well as those friends and foe who lost their lives in the 30-year-long in the war that prevailed in Sri Lanka. May they all be able to rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today, as well as that spare a moment to transfer merits to those people who might have lost their lives in the tsunamis and other natural calamities that might have happened, not just in Sri Lanka but also anywhere else, anywhere else in the world. If any of them are today seeking merits, may they all be able to rejoice in these merits. If any of them have been born in the woeful plains, may these merits help them to be born in the blissful plains. May these merits help them to abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Also, let us take a moment to transfer merits to everyone and every, to everyone who helped make this event a success by inviting you to be here, by providing you with transport or perhaps a drink of water to quench your thirst, perhaps by giving you a meal to say to your hunger, by making your stay here comfortable by providing you with the facilities, fans, lights and so on and so forth, as well as those who were involved in arranging the, the stage that you can see here today in such a way that if 
instills in you faith in such a way that it instills in you joy and bliss and respect and venerance towards the Maha Sangha, towards the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. May they all be able to rejoice in these merits, as well as yourselves, let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to those who live abroad, live in other countries, who, despite their distance, help make these events a success by spreading the word around with their friends and family, by making these facilities available for the benefit of all. For those who have made enable the technology that we use here today, microphones, cameras, the internet, laptops and so on and so forth, using the help of which we are able to disseminate this Dhamma for the benefit of all sentient beings. May they all be able to rejoice in these merits. May they all, through the power of these merits, abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Finally, let us take the merits, let us transfer Finally, may the merits that we have all acquired today in listening to this sermon, in preaching this sermon, in offering arms to the Buddha, to the Dhamma, to the Mahasangha, in all marks of respect and worship that you might have done throughout the day today, may all those merits that you have acquired today in engaging yourself in an uncountable number of meritorious deeds with every moment that you spent here, empower and energize all those beings, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasakas throughout the world just like yourselves to be able to attain Arahathun and may we be able to witness many hundreds and thousands of Arahathun Mahansas in this blessed land in the very near future. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu and finally may those merits that we have all acquired today help us all to become one of those Arahathun Mahansas, become one of those Arahat Nehinin Mahansas in the era of the Gautama Samma Sambhujana Mahansas itself, in this very human birth itself. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.